Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Kanang hapon po muli. Um, this meeting is now called to order. Um, let me uh, direct the uh, committee secretary to acknowledge our resource persons for this afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. We would like to acknowledge your guests and resource persons for this afternoon's public hearing. From the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, Ms. Wilhelmina Manyalak, Assistant Governor, Mr. Tomas Benjamin Marcelo, Senior Director. From the Department of Trade and Industry, Director Marjorie Ramos Samaniego. From the uh, National Economic and Development Authority, Director Brenda Joyce Mendoza. From the Professional Regula Regulatory Commission, Mr. Chofi Lopilando Jr. From the Department of National Defense, Colonel Larry Batalia. Mr. David Cruz. From the Bureau of Small and Medium Enterprise Development, Ms. Alicia Opeña. From the Construction Industry Authority of the Philippines, Mr. Ramon Abiera, Executive Director. From the Securities and Exchange Commission, Attorney Camilo Correa. From the uh, Insurance, Co Insurance Commission, Attorney Dennis Cabucos. From the Philippine Academic Zone Authority, Attorney Francis James, Francis James Brillantes. From the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Dr. Francis Mark Imba. From the Basis Conversion Development Authority, Ms. Eileen Zosa. From the Clark Development Corporation, Mr. Noel Manangkil. From the Europe European Union, Mr. Walter Van Hattum. From the European Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines, Mr. Florian Gotin. And Attorney Karine Fe Piokinto. From the Foundation for Economic Freedom, Mr. Margarito Tevez and Attorney Joseph Angeles. Sir, everyone has been acknowledged. Thank you, uh, Comsec. Um, this afternoon, we'll be tackling uh, Senate Resolution 73, uh, authored by Senator Crisco. Uh, unfortunately, uh, she cannot join us this afternoon. However, I think she has sent some staff to, uh, to, also, to also help out uh, during this meeting. Uh, the resolution calls for the review of um, RA number 7042, uh, also known as the Born Intention Act. And uh, uh, her intention is to review this uh, 27 year old law, uh, hopefully, uh, come up with some proposals to upgrade, update, amend, uh, improve on the uh, Born Intention Act. Um, as we all know, uh, attracting uh, FDI is one of the core um, activities of any administration. In fact, it's part of the, I think it's number three in the 10-point uh, uh, agenda of this administration. And um, we also know that um, attracting foreign direct investments has so many issues and so many um, uh, complications that we have to address. No? I think the top three uh, on the wish list of uh, foreign investors will be addressing the infrastructure gaps of the country. Um, the other one is uh, fighting corruption, and the other one is um, r reducing red tape. No? Um, these are normally what we hear from uh, potential investors uh, who are looking here uh, to invest here in the Philippines. Um, However, in 2000, uh, in 1991, FIA was uh, enacted, and uh, FIA is actually one tool to attract uh, foreign investors by identifying sectors that they can invest in. No? So um, it calls for the promulgation of the, uh, uh, the um, foreign investment negative list, in which it will tell uh, potential investors which sectors they can participate in, which sectors they cannot. Um, 
the hearing will focus on how to um, improve on this uh, Foreign Investment Act. Um, we will um, solicit some suggestions from the body, uh, some uh, information from the body on how to uh, use this tool, no? um, the FIA, as a means to attract more foreign investors here in our country. Uh, but having said that, we will also allow um, uh, uh, to digress a bit, no? to talk about the other facets of uh, attracting foreign investments. Uh, that's why we also inv invited um, members of the uh, uh, Joint Foreign Chambers, the European Union, uh, so that we can uh, get uh, first-hand information on uh, what really are the things that we should do you know, uh, in order to boost our uh, foreign direct investments. Uh, we've been performing quite well in the last uh, three years. I think we already breached the $10, mil $10 billion mark uh, in terms of FDI, but we're still lagging um, uh, in comparison to the uh, ASEAN 6 or the neighbors or our neighbors here in the ASEAN. So uh, we want to improve on things, especially on policy and reducing uh, restrictions on foreign direct investments. Um, with that, uh, we also invited uh, members of the uh, economic cluster, and we also invited some friends from the academe who can share um, some of their thoughts uh, in terms of uh, the Foreign Investment Act and also uh, boosting foreign direct investments. Uh, with, that, with, with that, we will start with um, the economic cluster. Um, since the FIA is uh, under the ambit of the NEDA, we will start with NEDA. And um, uh, we would like to hear some updates on FIA and also updates on the uh, uh, strategies to attract foreign, di foreign direct investments. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon to the uh, good afternoon to the committee and to the participants in this meeting. Um, uh, the secretary has already. We have submitted our comments on the uh, Senate resolution, and uh, if you if you will permit me to read the secretary's comment, uh, we find the resolution consistent with the thrust of the government to amend the restrictive economic provisions in the constitution and repeal or amend as appropriate relevant laws, rules, and regulations that impose restrictions on foreign participation in certain economic activities. We note that the FIA, as amended by uh, Republic Act 8179 in 1996, uh, opened up certain areas, but it still remains restrictive uh, with respect to foreign equity participation in certain investment areas or activities. Um, we also note that there are already certain proposals to amend uh, the provisions in the FIA, such as the lowering of requirements for foreign firms, um, specifically the employment requirement uh, for a 100,000 US dollars foreign investment in small and medium sized domestic market enterprises and the revision of the intention and extension of concepts used in the act. Um, we agree that the FIA is already long overdue for revisiting, for it to be more responsive to the needs of the domestic economy and accommodative to the dynamics of the global and regional environment. Um, the study and updating of the FIA, though, may need to look not only at the foreign equity limitations but also at the limitations provided in specific laws of investment areas or activities cited in lists A and B of the regular foreign investment negative list. Um, the study may also need to look at the limitations in issuances, uh, rules and regulations, admin circulars, admin orders, memo circulars, arising from the provisions of the laws indicated in the negative list. Um, examples of laws uh, that may need to be looked at would be those governing the practice of uh, professions um, regulated by the Professional Regulation Commission, uh, retail trade enterprises, and operation of public utilities, among others. Um, okay. 
the rest of the comments are more on the data uh, regarding the FDI. But in essence, we agreed that a study will need to be uh, conducted on the uh, effectivity of the Foreign Investment Act in attracting foreign investments into the country. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Director. Um, Director, I just have a few questions now for NEDA, since NEDA is the uh, um, implementing agency of this law. Uh, what are the low-hanging fruits no, that we can um, improve on in the FIA? Um, sir, the FIA actually allows the NEDA to formulate the foreign investment negative list, but that is only as far as we can go. The foreign investment negative list um, uh, has to have the entries in the foreign investment negative list have to have a legal basis. If, if uh, an activity is submitted to us for inclusion in the negative list and we find that there is no legal basis, the, there is no law that says a foreign equity limitation is imposed on that activity, then we do not include it in the negative list. So that is the, the uh, limitation of the formulation of the negative list. We need to have a legal basis. If there is no legal basis, then uh, uh, what do you call this? Mm, the activity cannot be included in the negative list. The negative list also is defined as the list of areas uh, where foreign equity is limited to a maximum of 40%. So anything above 40% we need not include in the FINL. Um, and then another concern may be for some would be the fact that the negative list is focused on equity, equity limitations. But there are other limitations on foreign investment, not necessarily limited to foreign equity. I don't know if uh, it is good to also consider it when we review the FIA. Uh, thank you, Mr. Well, Chair. I think we'll, we will uh, talk about that later on when we uh, ask the opinion of PIDS. I think that's uh, one of their uh, suggestions in their uh, policy briefs. No? Um, but, ma'am, uh, I just want to uh, go micro. No? Uh, there are a lot of industries here in uh, the negative list. No? And my point here is among the various industries and the var various sectors here in the negative list, ano po ang pwedeng, uh, what are the low-hanging fruits no, that we can amend right away and then we can see dramatic uh, positive um, impact to our economy and to our foreign direct investments? No? Um, uh, the reason why I ask that, because maraming maliliit, maraming may industries who dito, no, that uh, I don't know if they will have um, no, positive uh, impact or major impact uh, to our um, economy. No? But uh, I just want to, um, from your, from NEDA's point of view, ano ba yung mga pwedeng ma-amend ho natin dito? Of course, the constitutional uh, limitations, we should leave that uh, for now, no? because that will take a lot of time. But some of these uh, industries are um, regulated by specific laws. No? So a simple act of Congress can amend those specific laws. So ano yung mga industries dito na nakikita nyong pag gina in natin, we'll see uh, major impact in our foreign direct investments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one example would be the, the proposal in the House to define what is a public utility in the Constitution because uh, at the moment um, agencies, uh, implementing agencies of the Public Service Act uh, consider their uh, service sector as a public utility since the Constitution itself does not define what is a public utility. If the, the amendment of the Public Service Act 
uh, as it stands now in the House, wh where they limit uh, the definition of a public utility to, at I think, at only three uh, types of activities. Um, this would mean that mm, certain public services, which are currently being considered as public utilities, would now be opened up to more than 40% foreign equity. An example would be transportation, telecommunication, and the like. So these are uh, activities that require a lot of uh, big, huge capital investments, and opening it up to foreign direct investment could uh, spur the growth of the economy. Have you undertaken any um, any research no, as to, let's say, if we amend? No, I think uh, that foreign, that public services act is already being talked about here in the Senate, and I think that will happen. No? Um, but have you conducted any research, uh, for example, if we amend that public services act, what is the potential uh, foreign direct investments that the country stand to gain, uh, and so on and so forth? No, kasi marami ho ditong specific laws. Eh. But of course, when we touch on this, uh, the concept here is we remove the restriction, therefore we will attract investments. Pero gano kalaki po yung investments na yun? Baka it's a myth. Diba? Like for example po, private security agencies. No? I don't think this is a low-hanging fruit. No? The, I don't think uh, pag in-amend natin to, eh, there will be a major impact. I, 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 I might be wrong, ha, but I am not uh, an expert in private security agencies. But yung sinabi niyo kanina, public services, ito seems like it will, you know, we will have a lot of gain. But have you conducted each and every, a due diligence, a, you know, some form of research, how much the country stands to gain if they remove the equity restrictions based on the foreign negative list? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, admittedly, we, NEDAD has not yet conducted any study on the impact of uh, removal of the equity, foreign equity limitation. Um, well, at the moment, uh, we still don't have that capability. Well, the tools to do it. We may have the capability, but we don't have the time and tools to do it. Uh, I don't know if PIDS has somewhere in their uh, list of studies, uh, if they have any. Um, I, I, uh, if they have any on the economic impact. Um, I know they have a study on logistics, uh, and which is more or less uh, at, uh, tries to address not only equity limitations, but other uh, rules and regulations that hinder the, the uh, operation or the impact that has an impact on the uh, sector, on the economy. Uh, those restrictions on logistics have an impact on the economy. But I don't know if they have a, a, a study on the economic impact, per se. Um, the reason why I ask, no, um, the, the, the restrictions are really designed to uh, protect the um, local industries no, here in our country. You know, it's designed to protect, hopefully in the long run, strengthen the competitiveness. You know, because they're, you protect them, hopefully they gain, uh, they make uh, enough money to strengthen themselves so that when we open up certain sectors, they'll be, they can, they can, uh, they can withstand uh, foreign competition. No? Uh, that's the, 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 the theory behind but now, if we are saying that uh, we want to re reduce restrictions in equity, we are now opening up specific industries. No? But we have to also know what do we gain from those specific industries. Uh, that's why um, uh, there, there are so, nakikita ko dito may mga low-hanging fruits. Um, but how much are we, um, how much can we gain from removing those restrictions? both in FDI, both in employment, both in contribution to our growth. May mga ganito ho ba tayong, ano, may mga ganito ba tayong research? Because, you know, when we, um, actually, 
kami lang ho, we identified almost 12 specific laws that we can remove restrictions, covering 12 specific industries. Pag finalo namin yan, sigurado ho yung local industries na yun will probably uh, uh, throw something at me. No? So, but uh, we have to be ready no? on why uh, we are removing those restrictions. Is, you know, we're removing it because we want to improve competition. In, by improving competition, we improve on quality, lower price. May mga ganito ba tayong research so that we can uh, uh, argue using, um, you know, using statistics rather than the philosophical uh, spirit of uh, removing restrictions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, maybe I don't know if the BSP has one because they are the ones who recently opened up their sector to 100% uh, uh, foreign equity participation in banking. Um, what I can recall is the uh, liberalization of the telecom industry, but it's not it's not really the equity limitation, but uh, other some other restrictions on uh, participation in the sector. Um, another sector that could be an area of study would be the retail trade uh, services because um, the retail trade liberalization act opened up the sector to uh, 100% uh, foreign equity participation. Previously, it was totally closed. Um, um, uh, I think that's it. Most most of our liberalization efforts, because in the past, were more on the financial services side than in other uh, industries. Um, so the financial services sector may be a good, uh, uh, um, what do you call this, area to study with respect to the impact of liberalizing uh, the equity restriction. So, okay. Director, um, since you mentioned earlier that, um, sabi niyo kanina na uh, the inception of this law, uh, since the inception of this law, um, I don't think there's any uh, serious review no, on whether uh, FIA actually contributed uh, what it's supposed to contribute. No? And uh, a serious study needs to be undertaken. Um, can we assign that serious study to the NEDA uh, to, um, uh, so that uh, we will have um, a serious <laughs> discussion on how to uh, improve on FIA or update FIA, um, and also how to reduce restrictions in the various sectors. Um, I think we have to approach this um, scientifically, and um, since NEDA has the talent, no, I think PIDS is also, um, PIDS is under the NEDA family. Um, na namin sa inyo in study, you can assign it to NEDA. No? Ah, to uh, PIDS. No? So, um, I, I think to, to move forward lang, we need to really approach this um, as scientific as possible because we're talking about allowing um, foreign enterprises to compete with our local enterprises. And there'll be a lot of friction no, when we do that. And uh, But no, we have to keep an open mind because at the end of the day, what we want is to allow foreign capital to come in, you know, build assets here, employ people, and contribute to growth. But we have to have those numbers. You know? uh, all of this is in theory, madaling sabihin ho eh. No? Pero kung hindi ho natin papakita ho yung research, uh, mahirap ho. No? So we're um, assigning that study to NEDA, and uh, bahala na ho kayo kung assign niya ho yan sa PIDS. Um, the next on our list will be DTI, uh, attorney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I may be allowed to read the secretary's position, the DTI position on this matter. 
The department supports the objective of the proposed resolution to conduct an omnibus study and update RA 7042 or the Foreign Investments Act of 1992 in consideration of emerging global trends as a strategy to improve the Philippine investment climate. The net foreign direct inflows into the country continue to exhibit an, uh, an upward trend, increasing by 21.36% from 2016 to 2017 to reach its peak at uh, 10.05 billion. However, looking into the FDI, uh, FDA, FDI data of our neighboring developing economies, we see that the Philippines is still lags behind Indonesia and Vietnam. A study conducted by the OECD, OECD cited the benefits of FDIs, which include integration into the world economy, transfer of technology, enhancement of human capital, and enhanced efficiency through competition. While the FIA aims to attract, promote, and welcome productive investments from foreign individuals and entities, certain provisions of the law create substantial barriers in the achievement of its objective. Specifically, the FINL, which contains areas of economic activity wherein foreign equity is restricted or limited. Large domestic corporations in this economic activity have been effectively safeguarded by foreign equity restriction. It is the department's view that further liberalizing the Philippine market by relaxing or eliminating this restriction will allow the country to realize the benefits of FDIs. Also, as the world transitions into a borderless economic community, the objective of the proposed resolution facilitates the legal and reg regulatory adherence of the country to its bilateral, regional, and multilateral agreements, uh, including the ASEAN Comprehensive Investment Agreement, wherein the member states are encouraged to pursue a progressive liberalization of their investment regimes towards the achievement of economic integration. The department reiterates its support to the objective of the proposed resolution as a means to leapfrog the Philippine investment climate at par with its Asian neighbors and realize the benefits of FDIs in boosting liberalized and competitive economic activities in the country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Attorney. Attorney, meron ba tayong, ano, um, do we have a um, comparative analysis on equity restrictions vis-a-vis -vis, uh, RSE and neighbors? Do we, and how are we uh, faring? I, I know mar maraming industries yan, ano, but uh, I think there's a uh, measure on uh, certain restrict, uh, measure on restrictiveness compared to our neighbors, how are we faring in that? No, because the reason why I ask, no, we're competing with, no, with our with our neighbors here in ASEAN. So, gano kalayu hu tayo o gano ka? Uh, what is our grade in terms of restrictiveness? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I can only cite the recent uh, OECD on the investment uh, policy regime of the Philippines, wherein the Philippines was cited as the one of the most restrictive regimes. Uh, in, in Asia, it's actually um, it's second of the most restrictive regime in Asia. Asia, I forgot the the, but we could have that data, Mr. Chair. It's available in the OECD, which we conducted uh, help help conduct in the year 2016. Can you give us uh, some uh, detail on why we were considered um, one of the most restrictive? Uh, ano ba yung top three reasons for that uh, that branding? Uh, primarily, Mr. Chair, what was used as the parameter is the Constitution, okay. wherein most of the economic activities are found under the Constitution, especially yung, uh, public utilities, natural resources, those stuff, Mr. Chair. So, the Constitution yung isang uh, yes, reason. Uh, the, how about the other, what are the other reasons? Uh, One that is, that's the primary, Mr. Chair. Well, when you say Constitution, equity participation to. It's the economic provisions under the Constitution, okay. Article 12, Mr. Chairman. Okay. How about the other, uh, uh, what are the other um, um, reasons why we were branded as uh, one of the most restrictive in Asia or in the world yata ito eh? Uh, practice of professions, sir, isa rin po sa mga sinasite na reasons. We 
we we we are just going to submit an official the official cat uh, minister. I, I just want to things, um, yeah. get some uh, information uh, for the hearing for this purpose, so at least we can discuss um, um, some of the reasons why um, the Philippines has been branded as one of the most restrictive. Um, we also have some uh, some colleagues from PRC, so we can discuss that later on. Um, Kasama ho ba yung practice of profession in that restrictiveness? In terms of uh, the Foreign Investment Act, um, how do, do you, what, what do you suggest no, to get out of that branding? Um, how do we get out of that uh, branding? Of course, the Constitution will take, will take a while. No? So can we do anything uh, within this Foreign Investment Act to get out of that uh, branding? Hindi ko kasi maganda yung branding na yun eh. Sir, of course, the large chunk of that uh, getting out of the branding would be an amendment of the Constitution. And of course, as cited earlier, a redefinition of public utility would actually um, would significantly help in in, red in, in trying to uh, uh, avoid that branding. But uh, when we look at the FINL, Mr. Chair, um, we could only see like uh, a few, something like seven seven areas where it could be amended and these are governed by specific laws mr chairman can you um, identify those seven uh, thank you mr chairman um sir of course the first would be there are areas under the practice of profession where there could be some uh, amendment with respect to those that are uh, that we allow wait, uh, 39 laws have reciprocity clauses allowing foreign nationals to practice their profession subject to that uh, reciprocity uh, there are seven regulatory laws prohibitive so that could not be um, that could not be amended but there are other laws mr chairman that other professions that could be uh, allowed to be to have reciprocity as well to open it up to foreign uh, another mr chair is uh, the retail trade enterprises paid up capital of uh, 2.5 million us dollars uh, the ra 3846 which is private co radio communication network there's also an uh, pd presidential decree 440 which pertains to private recruitment whether for local or overseas employment and of course uh, we also have that contracts for the construction of uh, and repair of locally funded public works which is covered by uh, CA 541 and then we also have here uh, those infrastructure development programs covered by RA 778 uh, culture production milling processing trading except uh, retailing of rice and corn and contracts for the supply of materials, goods, and commodities to GOCCs, which is Section 1 of RA 5183, Mr. Chairman. So, Attorney, what you're saying is if we immediately uh, amend uh, seven, um, amend seven specific laws that deals with these seven uh, sectors, uh, we stand to gain immediately in the short term. Ito yung pinaka-high impact, in other words. I, I cannot say that for certain, but uh, obviously these are just a small chunk of uh, the industry. Uh, the large portion where uh, really infusion of investment would come in would be in the infrastructure, in power projects, which are basically covered by the 6040 requirement. Is that here in the... Um is that here in the uh, FINL? Sir, uh, these are covered again by natural resources so it's uh, and public utility, so it's under Article 12, National Patrimony of the Constitution. Sir. Right. But we're now amending the public, public services, no? yes, so that will, uh, that will hopefully cure uh, that uh, deficiency. No? Um, I, I've, I saw one uh, item here no? uh, that I want to 
discussed with DTI, yung contracts for construction and repair of locally funded public works. No? Uh, later on, we can talk about that uh, uh, in detail, but um, is this something that uh, the, co the countries can potentially gain uh, or uh, is this some is this a high impact um, uh, sector that the country can can gain right away I may uh, ask of uh, somebody from our DTIC app to maybe have a input on that Sige, uh, sir uh, good afternoon Uh, with the, uh, I don't know how to explain it from this side, but uh, uh, as far as the construction industry is concerned, uh, it has been always uh, uh, questioned about how, uh, about the ownership uh, of 60-40 for foreign contractors to come in. Uh, because of this, uh, the construction industry has actually established a 100% uh, foreign-owned uh, if they go into the quadruple A category. Uh, the contractors in the Philippines is not averse to having foreign contractors coming in, provided that they follow uh, and uh, conform with the standards and requirements of PICAB, which is the Philippine uh, Contractors Accreditation Board. Uh, and also, uh, foreign firms uh, can also enter uh, through other avenues, like uh, by uh, partnerships, uh, by joint ventures. So the construction industry per se is actually, uh, how do you call this? Uh, uh, a, there's a lot of possible entries of foreign uh, firms into the industry. So the only thing they are always questioning is the one billion uh, uh, in the uh, capitalization for quadruple A. Uh, but one billion uh, in, the r in that uh, law, they are required only one billion capital, but they are allowed to undertake three billion horizontal project and five billion vertical project. Uh, that is already, that's only about 20% equity of what they can participate in. And that's a minimum. That's not a maximum. So they can participate in a 100 billion project uh, and their only entry point is only 1 billion. W w that the local contractors, there are about 18, 18 uh, quadruple A's and two foreigners, uh, foreign firms that are already in quadruple A. I feel uh, the PCA also uh, welcomes uh, foreign entities uh, that bring in new technology and uh, uh, methods of constructions and they are welcome to partnership. Uh, what they don't like is uh, foreign firms coming in without capitalization uh, that is substantial because they will be competing with the smaller contractors uh, in the Philippines. And uh, there is still a lot of strengthening to do within the local industry so loosening this on the on the other end for foreigners uh, becomes uh, uh, how do you call this uh, unnecessary because they have already a lot of open ways to come into the country for participating. Sir, sir, can you can you interpret for me this uh, number fourteen? Ano ho ang uh, interpretation ho nitong sa F I N L? So yung um, Or see, direct attorney, can you interpret for us to the body what is this, um, uh, what is the interpretation of this number 14? So 
So, ibig, ibig ba sabihin nito, if I am, a, let's say, a, uh, a big uh, foreign construction company, and I want to participate in locally funded uh, public works. Locally funded meaning these are GAA, no? Uh, ito yung mga kalsada, ito yung mga tulay. I cannot participate. Only up to the extent of 25%, Mr. Chairman. So I can participate, line. but my maximum equity participation is 25%. Is 25%. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Oh, but uh, for example, I'm a big uh, company, no? and I want to undertake uh, big construction projects. Um, obviously, this is a very technical endeavor. Uh, I want control. Hindi, hindi ako participate. Sir, uh, the restriction is... Uh, only allows 25 25% percent foreign equity and you're correct sir this pertains to public works and yes it's under the GAA locally funded but sure. private uh, private condominiums sir is, malls uh, there's a quadruple A sir as explained by the director yun, yun, yun of the, yun kanini, uh, the director yun po but yung um, for for government projects public works it's uh, 75 25 sir this morning I so in the, uh, I, was, I was watching TV, I was watching the news earlier, and uh, I think there was a special report on the Build, Build, Build program, in which um, apparently um, some of the Build, Build, Build programs uh, na did delay siya, no? And uh, I think Secretary Villar mentioned that uh, uh, one of the reasons is because wala ng construction company na available sa dami ng ginagawa ng gobyerno uh, kumbaga over over capacity na sila no? and uh, the local uh, contractors uh, are ready you know, they don't have equipment anymore they're lacking um, uh, capacity anymore uh, therefore a lot of the uh, build 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 projects no? the 25 flagship projects are already de delayed no? um, can this uh, for example we amend this provision can can it can it um, resolve that problem with the build 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 program? Sir, I believe so. To a certain extent, it can. Because the reason earlier, according to Public Works, is lack of capacity. Correct? Tama po ba? And then si Eileen of BCDA, I can hear him. A lack of capacity. So. What we're saying, the locals cannot already take in projects anymore because of the huge uh, volume of projects being uh, undertaken by the government. Now, what, we're, uh, what I'm asking is, because of this restriction, big construction companies cannot come in and uh, help out in the Build, Build, Build program, correct? So, ang tanong ko, kung inamend din natin, anggal natin huto, can it help the government in its build, build, build program? We're already, we're only building 1.5 trillion uh, as of to date. Um, the target is 8 trillion by um, 2022. Eh, 1.5, hirap na hirap na ho tayo kumuha ng contractors. I don't know kung kakayanin ho ng 8 trillion. Can we solve that uh, bottleneck by removing equity restrictions in uh, the construction of public works, director. Any any one of you, ah, kasi kayo ho yung um, kayo ho yung economic cluster kaya. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, um, that that uh, portion of the negative list uh, excludes uh, projects that are under the BOT law, covered by the BOT law, or are funded uh, by uh, um, ODA. Uh, and therefore subject to international competitive bidding. Um, the, th the thing is, um, they are already allowed to come in, but their uh, license as a contractor or as a participant in that activity is limited only to that project. In contrast, uh, local contractors have uh, what they call a regular license. Um, I think I'm not sure. Very, I'm not very sure, but I think the quadruple A is a regular license. Yes. 
but they do require quite, uh, they have set a certain level of project uh, where the foreign contractor could participate in. My, my simple question, Director, is we, if we amend this provision, take it out from FINL, can it contribute to the build, build, build program of the government? Yun po yung, uh, yun po yung uh, simple could, question. It could open up the construction industry to foreign competi competition. But can it help in the build, build, build program? Uh, we hope so. <laughs> but of course, sir, uh, they, they will still be subject to government procurement. Uh, of course, of course. I mean, it goes through the normal yes, uh, procurement yes, law. So it's not only the removal of the equity restriction that will help, but there are also other uh, regulations that may need to be looked at to facilitate the completion, the entry of this firm so that we could do our build, build, build. Okay. Sige po. I, I, si Eileen, kanina pa kung gusto mag eh, but I will ask BCDA later, Eileen, to shed light on that uh, issue. We'll come back to that topic later on. Um, we, so that we can uh, talk to all the resource persons. Uh, PIDS, I think you have a very interesting policy brief. Um, can you discuss uh, the policy brief uh, to the body? Uh, good afternoon, uh, Senator. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to this uh, body. Uh, we submitted our comments earlier uh, on this public hearing and uh, essentially we make uh, five key points. The first one is uh, despite rapid GDP growth, the Philippines lags behind some ASEAN neighbors in attracting FDI and I don't think I need to expound on that as we already have uh, um, expressed that fact earlier. Um, the second is um, the factors that could explain the trend of Philippine FDI. And uh, we are basing our findings on a number of studies. Um, uh, so I think the key factors are um, stable long-term policy environment and adequacy of infrastructure um, for foreign investors to work in and of course the role of the domestic markets. Um, I think everyone has a copy of the paper, so I, I don't need to re read the And then... Just the, yung, ano nyo, yung, uh, direct to the point. No? Yeah, the, just the key ones. So the third is that as the Philippines has one of the most restricted environment for foreign investment, we support the call for studying areas where the Philippines can relax investment restrictions. And I think here we address what you have asked earlier about the restrictiveness ranking of the Philippines with respect to other ASEAN neighbors. Let me just um, cite the um, foreign, di foreign Direct Investment Regulatory Restrictiveness Index that's compiled by the OECD. And uh, the Philippines with a score of 0 0.41 so um, this restrictiveness index provides a score ranging from zero completely open to one completely closed. So the Philippines with a score of 0 0.41 is the only country scoring above 0 0.40. The country is more restricted than China, which has a score of 0 0.386, Saudi Arabia 0 0.36, Myanmar 0 0.36, and Indonesia 0 0.31. Other countries in the Southeast Asia can be considered liberalized with scores less than 0 0.2. The index includes foreign equity restrictions, screening and prior approval requirements, rules of key personnel, and other restrictions on operation of foreign enterprises. So those are for the four um, um, types of measures that are included in the index. In the paper, we also discussed some uh, the sectors where there is um, key restrictions, so the primary, secondary, and the tertiary sectors. Um, I think the most important uh, takeaway there is that our um, manufacturing or secondary sector is relatively open, and that's the only one that's open. Ev um, tertiary and agriculture are actually very restricted.
Uh, number four, um, it is equally important to address other determinants of FDI, particularly competitiveness, domestic markets, and adequacy of infrastructure. And uh, we cite the findings of Aldaba, um, Assistant Secretary Aldaba of the BPIBOI, and uh, um, Dean Aldaba of the Ateneo de Manila. So it's an Aldaba, Aldaba paper. Uh, so let me just cite one of the, her, their key findings. In the absence of fundamental factors such as economic conditions and political climate, tax incentives alone are not enough to generate a substantial effect on investment decisions of investors, nor can they make up for the country's fundamental weaknesses. So that's citing Aldaba 2006. And finally, we support the need to amend the constitutional provisions on foreign ownership restrictions. Um, Villegas in 2016 provided an explanation for the presence of economic restrictions in the 1987 constitution. And uh, I cited uh, him in there, but uh, also former president of PIDS, Dr. Lianto in 2014 supported the inclusion of the phrase unless otherwise provided by law to the foreign ownership restrictions of the Constitution, um, particularly Articles 12, 14, and 16. He says that by the inclusion of this phrase, economic provisions in the Constitution, including foreign limits to capital, are placed within the control of the legislature. Uh, and so those are the five key points of our uh, study. Senator. Thank you, uh, Dr. Francis. You also had... Um, Meron kayong policy brief uh, uh, on FIA, I think dated May of 2018. Um, and it talks about transparency. Are you familiar with that, Paul, sir? Uh, I think that one is uh, authored recently by... Yes, bago lang uh, Dr. Seraphica, I think. Oh, no. Yes, doc by, you know, uh, Dr. Glenda Reyes. Uh, he, uh, she's a consultant, consultant of uh, PIDS. Uh, there's a policy brief on, on, uh, on that, policy notes. And she talks about transparency. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the, I think the, the, the key spirit of uh, FIA is really to be more transparent to potential investors coming in no, by identifying uh, sectors that they cannot participate in. Mm -hmm. And um, what she is saying, but um, of course equity is one restriction, but there, there are other restrictions that are uh, in various specific laws, and those are not mentioned in the uh, FINL. So what she's saying is those things, those restrictions also, no, a non-equity restriction should be identified. Gusto ko sana discuss sa PIDS uh, that, that transparency uh, angle that your policy note uh, mentioned how do we, what are the items, what are the things that we should be transparent about, no? I mean, uh, of course, there's, there are a lot of uh, different restrictions, no, non-equity, but ano yung mga gustong ilagay, no, to be more transparent to potential investors? Uh, I cannot speak for uh, doc, um, Dr. Uh, Glen, uh, Ma'am Glenda Reyes, but, um, uh, from the top of my head, uh, I think what is important is um, the other the other aspects of, as I mentioned earlier in the o OECD FDI index, restrictiveness index. There's it's not just about foreign equity restrictions. So other rules like rules on key personnel, um, restrictions on operations of foreign enterprises and uh, screening and prior approval requirements. I think those are, th those are the things that we should be transparent about. Uh, do you think that should be included in the FIA, those items? 
Uh, usually it's in the implementing rules right, and but the implementing right. rules kasi is scattered it all over the place yes so yes I understand no, kung hindi mo na, uh, the, the feature of this FIA is that FINL na nandoon na lahat yung hindi pwede mong pasukan pero when you go into that uh, outside of that that list there are also other restrictions embedded in the specific laws no? so what she is saying is dapat naka-identify rin yun no, in the, um, I don't know if FINL or some other document, but uh, her, her point there is to make it more transparent to investors because that will enable them to decide quicker no, uh, whether to go in or not to go in. Uh, if, if I may, Senator, uh, other countries would do it this way. They have a portal that uh, includes all the restrictions and even the per uh, pertinent laws that are in uh, related to investment. So if we cannot um, include, because I think it would be it would make the law really very tedious to read. Um, if we cannot include them in the the law, then maybe it's also very important that we have a portal that would um, op um, provide. Uh, possible investors access to what laws that they might need to face? Um, wala pa tayo ngayon, that portal, we don't have uh, that mm. right now. I, we do have, um, so, well, as, as a researcher, I, we have... Uh, so, for example, there's a foreign, in, no, uh, foreign investor who wants to come in. Mm. Uh, is there a portal that that person can go in and see no, what are the sectors na hindi siya pwede? What are the sectors pwede? But these are the restrictions. I, I think if it's um, following the format of the FINL, no. But if we if we are looking at, for example, um, uh, regulatory um, portal, we we do have like for example, the Senate has a portal of um, all other studies, uh, all other laws that they have um, passed, uh, and also the con. House of Representatives and uh, even the Supreme Court also would be useful as with their portals. But I think that's you have the, to that's do the it. point of Reyes. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. all over the place. Yeah, I think, yeah. It's no, still it, it makes the over life of the, uh, I mean, not all investors are the multinational. Some of them are also medium sized companies that uh, don't have any experience with the Philippines or dealing with the Philippines for that matter. So, medyo, it's very complex. No? I mean, the, the, the I mean, the way you explain it is already complex. Just imagine explaining it to someone who hasn't set foot here in the Philippines. Uh, yes, uh, Senator, I, I agree. So how do we, what do you suggest that, uh, um, do we embed that transparency concept here in, in the law? Or do we just uh, tell NEDA again to come up with that portal? What is your suggestion? I, I, I really think that we should um, come up with a portal. Uh, it would really be, it's n because it doesn't just address the issues on FINL. It also addresses other issues, for example, trade restrictions, um, non-tariff measures, and non-tariff barriers. So tho those are other things. And even, um, for example, if even if you don't want to invest in the Philippines, but you want to uh, work here, um, you can also probably find those restrictions in that portal. So I think a, a portal would be more useful. She made mention here of a uh, transparency list. Here, a transparency list to supplement and to address the deficiencies of FINL. So um, I don't know if we will include that transparency list in the law. And the transparency list is actually to identify the non-equity restrictions. But marami ho yun eh. Well, uh, that's why I'm asking, ano ba yung, ano ba yung, what should be, what should form part of that transparency list? Because there's so many. No? Then I guess th uh, that it would answer, uh, the answer would really would be to have a portal because there's so many restrictions in in the implementing rules and regulations of all other uh, laws, not just the, the ones in the FINL, mm -hmm. it would really make it very tedious to read. And uh, so maybe it, 
the, the portal would provide a search searchability, access, more transparency, because sometimes if we um, put everything in one basket and everything becomes very complicated and even difficult to search, then um, it defeats the purpose. I, I uh, er earlier, we uh, assigned that study to NEDA. Can you guys collaborate and come up with those? No, because uh, the, the, the policy note that PIDS came out, it's quite uh, informative. No? Um, there are some concepts here that we can apply in order to make our uh, country more transparent to potential investors. But again, no, I, I, we have to, you guys have to coordinate and, and help us with uh, some concrete um, suggestions no, so that we can include that in our amendment, if ever we will amend or update the law. We have to have some concrete suggestion, or else, um, parang ano eh, parang uh, we might not hit the the goal. Uh, I will express that to our president, uh, Dr. Reyes. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Um, Kimba. Uh, we want to hear from BCDA, Eileen. Oh, Vince. Eileen earlier was nodding her head about construction. Eh. Uh, Mr. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I was. Oh, yeah. I, I apologize, Mr. Chairman, for being being late. Uh, I think the question was on the restrictions on the foreign investment negative list. Uh, for the record, Mr. Chairman, BCDA fully supports the position of NEDA and the economic team to ease the restrictions uh, contained in the foreign investment negative list especially in the area of, of public construction. Uh, as we have seen in the last couple of years, and especially in the past few months where we have been in the thick of implementation of the big ticket infrastructure projects of the national government, we feel that uh, a more open construction industry in the Philippines would greatly benefit not only the um, public infrastructure program, but the uh, uh, infrastructure development in general and also the construction industry in general as we know that uh, competition always yields um, positive results even for the industry itself it leads to uh, better innovation it leads to um, uh, more uh, uh, faster adoption of new technologies clearly uh, we have seen in especially in the in our neighboring countries uh, the inno technological innovations in the area of public construction have really gone uh, way, way ahead in the region. Uh, we've seen it in ASEAN, we've seen it in China, in, in Japan, in Taiwan, in South Korea. And I think uh, the Philippines, uh, the industry in the Philippines, and the country in general will benefit a lot from a, a more relaxed uh, industry, construction industry, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dizon. C can you share with us your experience? I know. Uh, BCDA is undertaking a huge um, government center project in Clark. And uh, earlier we were discussing about uh, um, foreign companies, foreign construction companies being restricted uh, in participating in public works or government projects. No? Um, uh, Eileen earlier was also trying to, uh, was nodding her head, but can, can can you share with us your experience in terms of undertaking public works, uh, big ticket projects uh, funded by the government, and how um, your experience dealing with local contractors, local con uh, contractors, and sourcing for uh, construction companies? Um, Eileen would really be in a great position because she's she's the chairman of our bids and awards committee for infrastructure, and she's bidded out and is currently bidding out uh, several. Uh, big ticket infrastructure projects. Um, so maybe she can add uh, a few things. Uh, but uh, essentially, I think uh, what foreign contractors bring to the table is, first of all, the depth of experience. Uh, for example, no, um, uh, and Eileen can talk more about this later. She, uh, currently, BCDA is bidding out a, a bridge and a road project. It's a, it's a close to 4 billion peso project. Uh, more than half of which is a one kilometer bridge across the Sakobia River in uh, in Clark. It's a six lane bridge, so it's it's probably going to be the widest bridge in the country, you know, um, once it's built. Um, and clearly, the uh, the 
the expertise needed to, to build this bridge, although there are several local companies that can undertake such a project, but the expertise that, say, the Chinese bring or the Japanese or the Koreans bring or even the Malaysians bring is clearly uh, um, really above the kind of experience that we've had. First of all, um, our longest bridge to date is still San Juanico, and it's, it's what, um, a little over two kilometers, whereas in China they just completed the, the Hong kong macau Zhuhai Bridge, which is 54 kilometers. You know, it's the longest bridge in the world. Um, in Malaysia, they've built bridges above 10 kilometers, so I think we can benefit a lot. And right now, among the uh, bidders, there are several uh, local partner, local construction companies that have already partnered with um, foreign firms, you know, um, Chinese, uh, Malaysian, uh, Korean, uh, and I think this is good for the industry in general, uh, Mr. Chairman. You know, it gives us, it gives the local players the the uh, the additional know-how and technology that we didn't have in the past uh, or we don't have at present and and it also is good for the government because and the public because it obviously uh, improves the the construction period the construction timeline you know, uh, uh, we can build faster and because of the use of these new technologies uh, for example mr chairman in the National Government uh, Administrative Center, which is a PPP uh, between BCDA and the Malaysian firm MTD Burhad. Um, almost all of our facilities are all uh, using the modern technologies of precast and uh, prefabricated, uh, prefabrication technologies. Uh, in fact, one of our facilities there, the National Athletes Village, will be fully prefabricated off-site, including the foundations. No meaning uh, they just come in as members, in members, and then they are uh, assembled on site. And because of this, we are able to build a five-story, uh, two five-story buildings uh, with a total of 500 housing units in only 12 months. So this just shows us the uh, advantages of, of opening up the industry. Um, but um, I guess the, the issue now is really the limitations, because right now under if it is under the GPRA, uh, the maximum foreign participation is only at 25%. You know. So obviously, foreigners will still join uh, as they have joined. But I think we will get even more and bigger players if those limitations are relaxed. Uh, and then I'll, I'll pass it on, Mr. Chairman, with your to Eileen to add more inputs to that. Uh, just to add, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's not just the foreign investment negative list that we will be coping with as far as uh, entry of foreign contractors to the construction industry is concerned. It's also RA9184 and it's IRR, <coughs> which is the procurement law, which uh, limits uh, foreign, in foreign uh, participation to not more than 25%. And uh, really, the benefits of foreign participation, we're not saying that it should just be all foreign uh, contractors. But um, the benefits of foreign participation is that it's not just capital or equipment, but technology, which results into more cost savings. And because we are pressured as far as timeline is concerned, they can, because of their capital equipment and technology, they can really execute the projects uh, much, much uh, faster uh, according to the timeline that uh, we have set for ourselves. In your experience, no, because I know BCDA undertakes really big projects, no, and um, uh, these projects are funded by uh, your own cash flow. Is, it, is that correct? Uh, um, some of them, uh, but for the uh, for the infrastructure projects that do not have any return, uh, Mr. Chairman, we do rely on subsidies from the national government, from such GA, as from such GAA. as from GAA, yes, yeah. such as the roads. Actually, we are bidding now. And um, from from your experience, no, um, since you're, you're building really big, you know, big ticket projects, how many contractors can undertake such a project at the same time? Because if you talk about the build, build, build project, hindi naman to subsequent eh. Hindi naman to gagawa ngayon, then bukas ito, and then you, know, you have to undertake maybe 100 projects all at the same time to finish it in the next four years. No? 
how many contractors can actually launch 100 projects all at the same time? I'm just floating a number, no? but I'm just saying it has to be simultaneous. Eh? How, how many, from your experience, I just want to, um, since you've, you have a lot of experience in big ticket projects. Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, I will, I will uh, respond to that. I just don't want to put uh, Irene on the spot because she's actually bidding out several big ticket projects as we, uh, as we speak. No, uh, but I think, um, first of all, let me just say, Mr. Chairman, that I think the, the Philippine construction industry is very well equipped to handle uh, these local projects. No? Um, however, as Irene said, uh, a lot of the projects, especially being implemented by this administration, are really massive in nature. They're mean, meaning big ticket. I mean, um, we're not just talking about, let's say for roads, no? Um, we're not just talking about one lane, two lane roads. We're talking about uh, six, eight lanes with bike lanes and pedestrian lanes, some, some, some which cover a right of way of about uh, anywhere between 60 to 80 meters. No, um, ano yan, talagang napakalalapad na, napakalalawak na kalye po niyan. Um, and plus, the big ticket bridges of the DPWH are really very, uh, uh, very massive and unprecedented, no? like the, the, let's say, the bridges from Panay, Negros, and Guimaras. No? These, are, these are really very long and wide bridges over water, no? which, um, I don't think our local contractors have the experience or the uh, or the technical expertise to build at this point. You know? So um, I think our local contractors can do multiple projects, but probably not uh, the big ticket projects under the build, build, build program, which are really um, projects that we have yet to do. Uh, in the past, you know, like the bridges, the trains, uh, the some of the um, uh, some of the railways, uh, the railways. Uh, uh, so this, I think, will really require foreign uh, expertise uh, and also foreign equipment. For example, po, no, yung uh, yung mga rigs na gagawin, no, uh, which will require. Uh, TBMs, tunnel boring machines, no, which we don't have here. No, we don't have them here. Only the probably the Japanese, the the Chinese, and the Koreans will have, and the, some of the Europeans will have those types of machines. So, uh, I think for those projects that we desperately need, uh, we will really need foreign expertise for those. So, um, Mr. Dizon, what will happen now? No, because what what I'm hearing is um, number one, we don't have the technology. Uh, number two, where our local contractors is up to their necks in terms of capacity. What will happen now to the build, build, build projects in the next four years? No? Because we're still only at the 1.5 trillion level. Meron pa tayong 8 trillion eh. No? So do, do we have the capacity to... The, kasi may restriction tayo ngayon eh. So our pool is just limited to the local contractors. Do we have, based on your experience, huh? um, do, do we have local capacity to uh, pursue uh, the build, build, build projects in the next four years? Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I, I believe so. I believe we do because, um, first of all, for the big ticket projects that I, uh, I mentioned earlier, there are really two main modes of the implementation of those projects. It's either through ODA, uh, and if it's ODA, there are really no restrictions uh, because of the uh, because of the executive agreements between the country, between the donor and the donor countries. Um, second is PPP, uh, and in PPP, obviously, there are also very the restrictions are more are more relaxed. No, but apart from that, uh, uh, and I think this is why NEDA, DOF, and DBM are really pushing for this very bold measure that has not been done before. We, of, of course, with the help of Congress, uh, is to really. Um, review and then eventually relax the foreign investment negative list. And I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, on the part of NEDA, construction is one of those areas that we want to relax. I think it's about time, Mr. Chairman, that we do this already, um, uh, given the constraints that you mentioned earlier. Makakatulong ba ito, Vince, if we take out the, uh, take out number 14, 
in the uh, FINL, which is the uh, equity restriction for public works? Tingin ko po, Mr. Chairman, malaki po ang may tutulong. Uh, dahil mas marami, kung mapapansin po natin ngayon, let's say DPWH projects, no? um, bihirang bihira or practically hindi sumasari ang foreign sa locally funded projects. And the reason for that is exactly what I mentioned, is that the participation under GPRA is really limited to only 25%. No? And um, if you're a big Chinese, Japanese, uh, South Korean contractor, medyo hindi ka talaga may entice na sumali sa, sa project na ganoon. Ang guess talagang napakalaki po ng proyekto. No? Um, and uh, I think if we, we relax the F F FINL on public construction, we will see more foreign firms uh, participating in locally funded projects, Mr. Chairman. So aside from, from capacity, do we see uh, some benefits in price? Uh, absolutely, Mr. Chairman. And I think uh, we, we, we have seen it already, for example, in our untied ODA projects, um, which are quite competitive. Like, uh, just to give an example, uh, I'm not sure if DPWH is here. I hope uh, uh, I don't make a mistake. But as far as I know, for the CLEX, this Central Luzon Expressway project, which, was an, which is an untied uh, soft loan from Japan, they opened it up to public bidding. And... Uh, uh, Chinese contractors won that uh, project, no? Uh, and 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 obviously the price competition uh, uh, plays a major factor in that, no? Uh, so I think, uh, no, uh, opening it up will definitely redound to cost savings on the part of government. But more importantly than the cost, it's really the uh, the new technologies and the corresponding improvement in quality of infrastructure that we will be getting. Uh, if we allow for more foreign uh, participants to come in. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. Thank you very much for that, uh, for sharing your experience. Um, next will be Banco Central. Ma'am. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. We have yet to submit our official comments on, on, on this particular resolution. Um, but uh, our initial uh, comments would be that we support the initiative since this will promote foreign direct investments and possibly reduce barriers to entry in certain restricted areas. We also see this initiative as uh, supportive of the government's aim to encourage more foreign investments into the country and is consistent with the country's undertaking under the ASEAN economic blueprint. Uh, perhaps, Mr. Chair, the direct role here of the central bank is uh, under Section 3.C, where it actually mentions that the term for an investment shall be an equity investment made by a non-Philippine national in the form of foreign exchange, etc., and duly registered with the central bank. So foreign investments, to be considered as foreign investments, will have to be registered with the central bank. On that particular uh, area, Mr. Chair, we'd just like to inform the body that uh, in the last uh, few years, we've actually, the BSP has actually embarked on a series of uh, liberalization of uh, its foreign exchange regulations, which include actually the registration of foreign investments. So we're still doing that right now. Uh, we're still in the process of uh, trying to find out how we can further uh, streamline the requirements under the registration process to be able to make it easier for foreign investors to come into the country. Thank you, ma'am. We'll, we'll uh, await uh, your uh, position paper. Um, next is uh, PRC. Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Thank you for this opportunity. Well, for the uh, Professional Regulations Commission, uh, practice of profession in the Philippines is defined by the co res reserved by the Constitution to its nationals unless otherwise provided by law. And under the law, we find they are basically under the specific regulatory laws of its profession, the uh, law of the Professional Regulations Commission, as well as treaty provisions wherein there are commitments of the country. Uh, to correct, I mean, to update, uh, I think earlier it was mentioned that there are seven professions st still that are close to foreigners. Under the 10th uh, foreign negative uh, investment list, there are only five. And for the proposed 11, the PRC rec just recommended two because the loss of three, of the other three professions were already amended. Uh, 
there, are, there is the provision on reciprocity in each of these uh, uh, professional regulatory laws, as well as uh, provision under the PRC law, wherein uh, special temporary permits are, are issued to foreign nationals for special or temporary practice of their professions in the country. So, uh, uh, basically, Mr. Chairman, uh, the PRC is supportive of the uh, moves to open up the practice of the professions in the country, not only because of uh, the investments it brings in the country, but because being a major service uh, exporter, uh, we, we want also to provide the best uh, terms for prof Filipino professionals overseas in their practice of their professions. With that, Mr. Chairman, uh, basically that's the gist of the position of the PRC. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, th th um, over the years, no, I, I think the number of professions under the FIMNL has been going down. No? And you mentioned earlier nga that in the proposed 11th, it will be reduced to two professions. Na lang. Um, and this is because of the specific laws, specifically mentioning uh, reciprocity. No? Without any provision on reciprocity. Without any yes. provision. Oh, dapat may provision. Yes. Dapat may provision. Dapat. Ja? But otherwise, we can still pro provide these professionals, these in this uh, closed professions, with special temporary permits under the uh, PRC law. My question itong reciprocity, are, nagbe benefit ba tayo o nagbe benefit yung pumapasok dito? Do we have any research or data? Um, uh, uh, concluding whether we are benefiting from this reciprocity or not? Well, uh, offhand, we don't have really uh, still uh, 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 definitive study on this, but offhand you could say that we benefit because like say for uh, the profession of nutrition and dietetics, the Philippines is one of the four countries where in the U.S. would have a reciprocity on that. And most Filipinos means we send more nutritionists to them yes. than we than hire, they, they than they send more nutritionists to us. That's right. Okay. But uh, that pr that uh, gives opens avenues to Filipino professionals overseas. Okay. Um, I think it's also quite important to have some form of research, no? On a per uh, again, we, we are uh, anecdotally, marami uh, tayong that we're benefiting. Of course, the 10 million Filipinos abroad is a ultimate testament that we're somehow benefiting from this reciprocity. But uh, I'm just quite curious on yung specific industries kung talagang nagbe-benefit tayo o hindi. But is, is there any profession here that we don't benefit and the other country is the one benefiting from your knowledge? I mean, we reduced it from the high of 90 professions yun, ano? From uh, there are started. 43 regulated professions. And then now here. down to two? To only two. Uh, so, meron bang profession doon na hindi tayo nag-benefit? Uh, well, we don't, we're again, we're, we're also basing it on some anecdotal mm. uh, data. Mm. But in general, being a service exporter, yeah. we believe that, I mean, uh, uh, if it, it doesn't benefit domestically in terms of investment, then at least it benefits the professionals abroad. So, in other words, uh, we stand more to gain if we reduce, uh, uh, then actually we eliminate professions here in the FINL. Uh, we believe so, Mr. Chairman. There's a proposal from Congressman Arthur Yap to completely remove uh, the practice of profession in FINL. Is that something amenable to, uh, in FIA? No? Uh, Is that amenable to... Um, PRC? Well, eventually, if that would lead also to the amendment of the pro regulatory law of those two professions, eventually yes. it would open up. Basically, what he's saying is let the specific laws regulate mm -hmm. that profession. Hindi na lalagay ho dito. Uh, yes, but and in the two provision, in that two professions, uh, it's closed. And these are the professions of criminology and uh, radiologic and x-ray technology. Uh, that means they lack they specific lack, laws. Yes. No? Provisions but in their law to, provision, okay. to allow foreign practice. Okay. Is there is this two professions, uh, from your opinion, do we need to uh, include a 
reciprocity clause in their own charter, in our own laws? Yes, Mr. Chair. In fact, there, is, there is no risk, for example, criminology. Well, uh, the, I understand that the profession is also undergoing some re-engineering mm. because it's not just on security or law enforcement, but uh, even uh, personal personal security now is an, is, is an s s skill that can be exported overseas. It's not necessarily just a skill for l employment to local enforcement. I think yung uh, X-ray technology may less risky, I think, you know? but uh, I'm just talking about from a national security standpoint in criminology, normally uh, that profession um, uh, ano siya, nasa, uh, no, practice of enforcement or investigation. Uh, when we have that reciprocity, do you see any risk? Well, I th we believe that the profession is also uh, evolving mm -hmm. and eventually it would also have its potentials overseas to be. But as a concept, Chairman, you're, you're amenable to just completely removing uh, as much as possible all the professions or the, the restriction on professions here in the FINL? In general, Mr. Chair, yes. Okay, all right. Thank you, thank you. Uh, SEC, we have the... Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, earlier, the Securities and Exchange Commission submitted its uh, uh, comments position paper on the uh, resol resolution. Uh, most of the points we've covered in our position paper have already been discussed, but let me just summarize the major observations of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, in the many years that it has served as uh, the agency which administers and one of the agencies which administers and implements the uh, Foreign Investments Act. Uh, one, firstly, on the exercise of uh, uh, profession, new laws have been passed which permit or allow the corporate practice of professions. In the recent years, SEC has been confronted with requests for opinions regarding the, uh, uh, most recently, the Real Estate Services Act, as well as the uh, in, uh, Interior, de uh, Interior Design Act, because these two laws allow professionals to organize themselves into corporations uh, in the exercise of the profession. Uh, the question, Con which con uh, confronted the SEC in their request for opinions was whether or not these laws or whether or not these laws allow the entry of foreign professionals to participate probably as stockholders, shareholders, or investors in these corporations uh, to be organized to exercise su such professions, interior design, and more recently, uh, real estate services. It is unfortunate that this particular laws uh, did not provide explicitly that foreigners can participate as investor shareholders in these corporations which can be organized. Uh, it has to be noted that the cons in the uh, Constitution it is explicit that the practice of all professions shall be limited to Filipino citizens, that being the general rule. However, it was followed by the phrase, save in cases prescribed by law. So the uh, exceptions should be provided clearly in the enabling laws which permit the entry of uh, foreigners in the exercise of profession. Uh, earlier, the chair, chair's question was, can this be considered a low-lying fruit? Uh, in our minds, Mr. Chair, it can be because it can be addressed by mere amendments uh, or fine-tuning of the pertinent uh, laws which regulate these professions. Or, actually, we have, in our opinion, we have submitted the issue actually to the interpretation of the Professional Regulation Commission as well as the uh, NEDA, which is tasked to interpret and implement further uh, these laws which uh, regulate the entry of uh, foreign investments or foreign investors into these business activities. Uh, we also mentioned in our position paper chair the relaxation of foreign ownership requirements when it comes to lending companies, financing companies, and investment houses. However, there is still that provision in the uh, FIA which reserves 
uh, to Philippine nationals, uh, business activities with less than uh, 200,000 US dollars paid in capital. So in most activities where uh, foreigners are allowed to participate 100%, uh, this provision in the FIA would still come into operation. Uh, in this, well, actually, in our minds, 200,000 US dollars is merely around 10 million pesos. And perhaps, reserving this really to uh, Philippine nationals. Perhaps it's still rational and reasonable. The other area which we would like to mention, Chair, is the matter of educational institutions. Uh, SEC was confronted with a query on whether uh, an, uh, an Engl English language school can be 100% foreign owned. Uh, so we were confronted with interpreting the constitutional provision on, uh, on uh, educational institutions. Uh, to quote, educational institutions other than those established by religious groups and mission boards shall be owned solely by citizens of the Philippines or corporations or associations at least 60% of the capital of which is owned by uh, Filipino citizens. Uh, we had to uh, ask the TESDA for some inputs when it comes to English language schools. In response, TESDA cited the case, this is a Supreme Court case of People of the Philippines versus Foster, which uh, uh, said that the term private school or college shall be deemed to include any private institution for teaching. And for that matter, if they offer courses for kindergarten, primary, intermediate, or secondary instruction, or this uh, particular phrase, or superior courses, in vocational, technical, professional, special schools by which diplomas or certificates are to be granted or titles and degrees conferred. So in that Supreme Court decision, it appears that if diplomas or certificates of, are awarded or titles and degrees conferred, conferred then uh, uh, that activity falls within the definition of educational institution. Uh, in this particular case, in this particular request for opinion, the uh, entity said that, of course, it would issue certificates to those who will pass their English, English language training. So for that matter, we were constrained to say that they are limit, the foreign ownership, uh, foreign ownership is also, also limited for English language schools. Earlier, Chair, we were also talking about public utilities. We agree with previous observations Actually, we actively participated in the deliberations in the lower house on amendments in the Public Services Act. And we are very much supportive of uh, finally uh, having a definition for public utility and uh, clarifying what is a public utility and what is a public service or a public utility under the Public Services Act. Lastly, Chair, we would like to call attention on uh, our experience when it comes to uh, issuing opinions involving mass media. Well, uh, we were very much influenced by the earlier opinion issued by the Department of Justice defining what a mass media is or what mass media activities is. So it said that it's, uh, if it refers to any medium of communication designed to reach the masses, which tend to set the standards, ideals, and aims of the masses, then it would fall within the definition of mass media. And what would be the allowed? We find guidance in the 2003 Tobacco Regulation Act, which states that, well, in its enumeration of definition, it defined mass media as referring to any medium of communication designed to reach a mass of people. And for this purpose, it further defined that mass media includes print, print media, such as, but not limited to newspapers, magazines, and publications, Broad broadcast media, such as, but not limited to radio, television, cable television, and cinema, and it, in, it uh, uh, ended its enumeration with the phrase electronic media, such as, but not limited to the internet. We are confronted, Chair, with interpreting whether the internet as a platform should be included in the definition of medium for mass media. Uh, on that regard, we would like to get inputs also from the uh, Department of Information and Communications Technology. 
as well as the National Telecommunica Telecommunications Commission, as well, of course, from the legislature itself, because it would be the legislature which will define actually what mass media activities is, considering the latest advancements in technology and the fact that really it's uh, getting to be a uh, global community. Uh, internet is fast being used as a medium, really, uh, for interchange of information. That ends our opposition paper, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney. Uh, please submit to us your position paper. I know for a fact that uh, there are a lot of things that we need to um, clarify no, in the FIA. I think one of the letters I got from the Joint Foreign Chambers is the uh, uh, interpretation of domestic market enterprises, no, whether sole proprietorship uh, is considered a domestic market enterprises. I, I think. Uh, SEC ruled that uh, it is. No? Therefore, they cannot participate uh, if they don't have a capital of 200,000 requirement. requirement. Yes. Correct. No? Uh, uh, 200,000 uh, 200, US, US dollars. So Regardless of uh, what kind of entity it is. Correct. Corporate correct. or sole proprietor. I think, if they, I think um, they have a different interpretation on that. No? But um, we, we, since we are already updating FIA, uh, we, would like, we would appreciate uh, your suggestions on how to clarify uh, certain terminologies here so that it will be very clear for uh, investors when they uh, plan to come in. Yes, Chair. We'll Thank be you. glad Thank to participate. Thank you, Thank you Attorney. Uh, next is um, BS Med, Bureau of Small and Medium Enterprise Development. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, reference to small and medium uh, sized domestic uh, market enterprises um, was made on Section 8 of the law. And uh, coming from this med, we support uh, retention of this provision so as to give a chance for MSMEs to grow and prosper uh, without facing uh, stiff competition from bigger capitalized uh, foreign companies. Um, we've heard uh, positions of the various agencies on the uh, capital or paid in equity capital amount, so um, we would defer to um, the expert advice from maybe SEC, but uh, from the um, BISMED side, um, perhaps uh, we could also revisit uh, the, uh, because we use asset size as uh, um, definition and not really paid in capital, so perhaps uh, we could uh, coordinate with other agencies and look into the um, uh, what amount could be um, more beneficial for SMEs as, they, as we give them a chance to grow in a uh, globalized uh, economy. That's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, next is uh, Department of National Defense. I'm from... Uh, Colonel Larry, uh, uh, Colonel Larry Battaglia, sir. Um, the uh, BND and AP supports the amendment of uh, the um, FIA for the following reasons. Um, it will allow the defense industry investment from other countries. With, uh, with this, sir, our dollars with, will stay intact and and we can, uh, we can pay them in pesos. Uh, we could develop our self-reliance de self defense posture since uh, we require for investors to have their technology transfer to us. Our local industries will be challenged uh, to upgrade their capabilities to cope with the uh, foreign investors. And uh, I could say that the procurement law uh, can serve as a check and balance uh, and uh, I should say because uh, foreign investors cannot monopolize as suppliers and uh, I think uh, Mr. David Cruz will uh, add more on the position of the DND sir. Good afternoon Mr. Chair. Uh, we were we would like to convey first that we have not submitted a position uh, because this the invitation came late. Uh, so we're good at defending. <laughs> anyway, sir, um, 
our office at the department in support of the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, facilitates the issuance of clearance to foreign investors who want to come into the country. And uh, for data, uh, data perspectives, we can commonly count in our fingers the number of investors who are interested on defense industries. Um, so that is, that is why in one of the economic development cluster meetings, we recommended to ease the restrictions to allow foreign investments on defense industries. For the very reason that we would like to promote local defense industry in support of the requirements of the capability development of the armed forces. So um, <coughs> the modernization program of the AFP is costing the government billions. And uh, we are spending that money to foreign countries who are proponents or uh, contractors of certain defense equipment. Unfortunately, it does not redound to the domestic economy. So our socioeconomic sectors do not benefit from that procurement of defense material. On the second note, we want to promote defense industries so that our national interest will be supported and sustained. Why? The very reason is that defense industry is what other countries um, recognize as a genuine modernization program. So that is, if we have our own defense industries, in the event of war, we will not depend on other foreign countries for our, to fight for this country. That's the other concept. And thirdly, um, the restrictions have affected us in terms of promoting capacities for technology transfer, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, we have not even initiated to build our capacities for defense scientists and innovators. So uh, unlike our ASEAN neighbors, particularly Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, they have uh, a lot of defense industries and they can support their own even in times of crisis, conflicts, contingencies, and war. Um, well, we also need to promote the inflow of foreign investments on defense industries because we would like this material requirements for the AFP modernization, like India, to be made in the Philippines. And of course, if we do that, we, we will be generating a lot of employment opportunities. And we know for a fact that our niche is we have a lot of skilled workers, uh, spe especially for shipbuilding, even aerospace, uh, because uh, most of our maintenance, repair, and operations are, we have a lot of trainees from the Air Force uh, getting their education from foreign schools. So um, luck, relaxing uh, foreign investments will contribute a lot. And then um, the other reason why we want to promote, uh, promote uh, investments on defense industries is that we would like to capacitate more of our Filipino talents in terms of uh, defense science and of course um, promoting social development through economic empowerment. So that would be all, sir, uh, for the Department of Defense. Mr. Cruz, uh, what you're saying is your uh, the DND is amendable to remove the 40%
Yes, sir. Um, I, I would assume, provided that you were with that clearance when they put up uh, anything in line with the defense industry. Yes, sir. And in line with that, uh, we know that uh, the Strategic Management Act was passed in 2015. That's one regulatory framework for the movement of defense-related uh, and dual-use goods technologies in and out of the country, which is in support of uh, the international framework for regulating weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and uh, we al also have other uh, laws that, uh, well, maybe, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to mention that aside from counting fingers of the existing local defense industries, we know for th these, this, these are Arms Corps, UDMC, and only a few. But we found out that uh, in PESA zones or economic zones, we found out a lot of defense-related industries who never went through the Foreign Investment Act. And uh, they are mainly export-oriented companies and did not also go through SEC. Yes, because it's uh, PESA-regulated. PESA so. Uh, I, uh, I know you would be surprised to hear that the um, uh, radio frequency ID of the Lockheed Martin missile defense systems is being produced here in the Philippines. So, and we never knew that uh, un unless uh, we, from one of the fora, we heard that there was one company in Cavite producing that. So, uh, and. Uh, it's uh, unfortunate for us because we are l trying to develop uh, defense capabilities and yet uh, we are very limited not only in the procurement process but also in the access to technology and local uh, available industries. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cruz. Uh, next is Attorney uh, Funa of uh, Insurance Commission. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, for the Insurance Commission, we, have to, we will be submitting our position paper, but uh, I would like to inform this committee that uh, the laws being enforced by the Insurance Commission uh, does not contain any limitation on foreign investment to entities or activities regulated by the Insurance Commission. So the last restriction was actually on the 60% uh, uh, foreign ownership on adjustment company, which was already removed by uh, Republic Act 10881 in 2016. So, wala na adjustment companies? So, sa 11th, wala na siya? In the 10th, there's a... Uh, okay. So, in the 10th, it's still here. 10th FINL. But in the 11th, it's out now. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, attorney. Uh, next will be PESA. Honorable Senator, on behalf of our Director General Charito Plaza, thank you for inviting PESA to give its input. If I may, Honorable Senator, may I read some portion of our opi uh, position paper? The Philippine Economic Zones Authority fully supports and interposes no objection to the Senate resolution which seeks to initiate an omnibus study and eventual amendment of the Foreign Investment Act of 1991. The Philippines has a relatively restrictive and less competitive policy on foreign investment, especially as to the latter's role in our local market as compared to our Asian neighbors who have truly modernized, liberalized, and promoted foreign investment. Initially, Your Honor, we propose that the omnibus study include the following. Number one, uh, a study on whether or not some in the some limitations or prohibitions on some uh, the, f the, the foreign equity restriction on some areas of investment may be further studied to determine whether or not liberalizing the same encourage more foreign investors that may plug the gap in the supply chain. Number two, lowering the export threshold requirement from 60 to at least 50% for foreign-owned corporations. This will entice and attract more 
market seeking foreign investors engage in manufacturing and agriculture to sell more to the domestic market. Number three, lowering capitalization requirement. Uh, on behalf of PESA, we would like to study this further, but we would like to limit the study on only limiting the capitalization requirement and not totally removing the same. We would also like to revisit some sections of the Foreign Investment Act, specifically Section 3, subparagraph letter E, which defines what is an export enterprise. To it, it, it is defined as follows. The term export enterprise shall mean an enterprise which produces, produces goods for sale or renders services to domestic market entirely or if it's exporting a portion of its output fails to consistently export at least 60% thereof. Um, and we would also like to revisit the criteria of NEDA under Section 9, specifically subparagraph A to it, the industry is controlled by firm, firms owned at least 60% by Filipinos, and subparagraph E as to quantitative restrictions are not applied on imports of directly competing products. Lastly, Your Honor, it is uh, in our position that that we would like NEDA to retain the power and jurisdiction to formulate and, recall and recommend the regular negative list under Section 8 of the Foreign Investment Act. That is all, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney. Um, uh, next is Subic Bay. Uh, Metropolitan Authority, Attorney Kubinting. Uh, Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have yet to submit our position on the matter. But uh, offhand, uh, we, we have very liberalized policies with regard to foreign investments, which are embodied in the Public Act 7227, or the Subic Pay Report and SBMA Charter. We are able to accept any local or foreign investments only subject to the policies uh, of the BCDA, which exercises oversight functions over SBMA and without prejudice to the national re nationalization requirements under the Constitution. To date, our main concern, Mr. Chairman, would be the lack of uh, available areas where foreign direct investments can put up their businesses because uh, the nature of uh, the free port is that only about 15% of the land area is uh, developable, considering that about 75% is protected area, which consists mainly of uh, virgin forests. So we are looking at a new frontier which is on the other side of Subic Bay, the northern side, uh, referred to as the Redondo Peninsula, <laughs> which we intend to open up for industries and uh, mixed-use commercial activities. This will require a lot of foreign investments, Mr. Chairman, and uh, accessibility to the Redondo Peninsula, which by the way were Hanjin Heavy Industries Corporation, uh, reportedly or reputedly the fourth biggest ship manufacturing area in the entire world. Our concern is connectivity to the Redondo Peninsula and uh, the best uh, method by which to achieve that is to the construction of a bridge 
which would be roughly about five kilometers, Mr. Chairman. And we are presently entertaining uh, in, uh, uh, companies that have expressed interest in developing the Redondo Peninsula as our new frontier, um, and which will open up the western side of uh, Luzon, the Zambales coastline, from Redondo Peninsula all the way up to the municipality of San Antonio Zambales. This um, envisioned developments will need foreign direct investments, Mr. Chairman. So we will outline our concerns and uh, requirements to achieve uh, these uh, visions in our position paper, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney. Uh, CDC, Mr. Uh, Noel Maninkil. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Um, CDC's uh, Development Trust is a uh, work we play and environment, and we host the Clark International Airport, and tourism is a, is a big component. And um, two industries we are recommending to be part of the study as support industries. That will be in the area of retail and also restaurants. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you elaborate further? Um, Mr. Manankil, um, back at retail and back at the... Uh, yes, Bob, because we are covered by the R Retail Act, so there is prohibition now on on the uh, entry of foreign, uh, full 100% full foreign equity in, in retail and also for restaurants. But, um, uh, what, what is your experience with retail? And uh, we, we know there's restriction, no? but what, what's your... Uh, exp what was your experience with this uh, restriction? Um, right now, because there is a developing market for uh, high-end retail, and uh, sometimes it's, it's only provided by uh, foreign outfits that can bring in the, the, mm -hmm. the required brands uh, that will cater f to foreign nationals. Are there any inquiries? Yes, po. Uh, it's some of the tourists that are coming in, especially the tour operators, require high-end high -end shopping. And um, they require high-end shopping, and the, uh, the retailers will require 100% uh, ownership. Yes. The and the that is your players. constraint right now. Yes. Can you quantify ilang ba yung ganitong mga cases? I just want to, I'm just curious, no? how many inquiries did you have to uh, turn, turn down because of this restriction? Uh, Probably in because of the development of the of the airport, uh, at least ten uh, inquiries would want to put up shops in in in, in Clark that will uh, for the in the last year just to uh, to fill the the need for a high end uh, shopping. Um, where are these? Uh, uh, what what countries are these? Um, uh, are Koreans from? and uh, also Chinese. Okay. So ano ang uh, ginawa nila? Walang they just left? Uh, yes, sir. Um, so it, it's one area that is still unserved, which is a vital component if you would like to attract uh, the tourists in, in inside Clark. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ma'am, Director. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, under the retail trade law, um, uh, retailers of high-end or luxury goods are allowed up to 100% ownership. Uh, provided that they meet a certain uh, capital uh, investment per store basis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would assume that the inquiries are, did not meet any of those uh, requirements. Yes, sir. So we will take note of the requirement. Uh, we'll I would that. assume mas ma lili yata sila. Yes, Paul. And that is also one of the, uh, we're, we're actually the retail law is um, attracting the bigger, the bigger brands, but the medium-sized brands, we alienate them, and I think those are the ones um, inquiring no, with CDC. Yeah. All right. uh, PCC, Attorney uh, Agdamag. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Philippine Competition Commission has yet to submit its position paper on this uh, resolution, but to be consistent with its position on other related matters, such as the amendments to the Public Service Act, 
in the proposed review of the Retail Trade Liberalization Act, the PCC is gener generally supportive of the moves to uh, um, review the restrictions found in the foreign investments law, so as to make um, because this because this will um, obliterate barriers to entry and this will make our industries more competitive, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Do you also have the same question with Neda? Mayro ba kayong research on uh, uh, because some of this um, what's what's included in the foreign negative list essentially eliminates corrupt uh, eliminates competition, correct? Because it prohibits um, entry of um, uh, foreign operators. No? Mayro ba tayong study because of this restriction? Uh, what are we losing out no, in terms of pricing, technology, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of let's say, uh, know-how? Uh, let's, let's, let's probably peg on pricing. No? How much are we paying more expensive because of this restriction compared to a, let's say, a more liberalized uh, uh, policy on certain industries? Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Um, the PCC has yet to conduct a comprehensive study on the impact of these restrictions on all of the industries. So what we do have is, for instance, case by case, depending on an industry. Um, Kayong industry that is in the FINL, that I you have done a case study? For construction, we've submitted a paper on construction. And for telco, it's more of the a comparison of the prices uh, in globally. But c can you uh, discuss with us the construction? I know you had the policy mm -hmm. brief on that, you know. Um, I think because of the restrictedness, restrictiveness in the construction industry, uh, we're paying uh, much more. Uh, um, can, you, can you discuss briefly the policy paper that you, uh, that you, uh, 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 Mr. Chair, I'm not actually uh, particularly aware of the fine de details of the policy note. However, we are of the position uh, that um, these restrictions should, uh, that the f construction industry should be totally opened up to foreigners. Uh, we can uh, furnish the committee with a copy of the policy note that we've submitted to the House, Mr. Chair. When you say construction, but the private sec, but the private construction projects. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, it pertains to the entire uh, the entire industry, industry yes. private and public. Yes, Mr. And, Chair. And is, what is the reason for that? Of course, uh, you know, conceptually, you know, more competition, blah blah blah, impression. But do we have evidences that will say that uh, prices will go down and you know, other countries are paying this much, and we're paying this much? Mayro ba tayong ganyan? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Actually, uh, the study, the policy note actually cited um, quantitative data. Um, I don't have a copy right now, but uh, we can provide the uh, committee as soon as possible. Okay. Just uh, submit to us that uh, research. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a manifestation on the construction type. Uh, the construction industry authority and also the contractors have no operation in foreign contractors coming in. Uh, more so for investors to be coming in. Uh, sometimes there is a uh, thinking that investors are contractors and contractors are investors. Uh, they are to totally two different uh, types. Uh, investors, they bring money. Contractors, uh, they may bring money if they like, uh, if they are uh, developers also, but uh, they are also a service, meaning they are providing service and they take out money too. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'd like to stress is that uh, there is a liability of 15 years uh, after the construction. It's not unlike the problem is not coming in. It's the problem is when they come out. Uh, because uh, they will be leaving the project, and uh, it's already happened uh, in one case that the contractor just left. So there is a liability problem. This goes with the same with the professions of architects and engineers. There is a liability clause in our profession, and so if you allow, for example, uh, contractor, foreign contractors to come in, they have to stay. In that case, uh, you'll be able to hold them. But if they just come for one project and leave afterwards, I think uh, we should uh, look at that also, the point of view when they start to leave. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
we'll go back to that concept later on. No? Um, next will be European Union, um, Mr. Walter Van Hattem. Thank you very much, Senator, Chair, Committee, Your Excellency. Um, just to start with, uh, I mean, thanks for inviting us. I know I'm an outsider, so, but I, I hope I can, can transfer some of the wisdom we've been building in Europe as well. Um, but two articles came out in the last few days which make this, this hearing even more important than it was already. Uh, I think yesterday I saw in the news that the PESA reported investments went down by 53% or so. Um, and today Fitch uh, reported, I don't know if you saw that, uh, that they keep the investment grade for the Philippines, eh, which is very good, eh, because it took the Philippines quite a lot of policy reforms and a long history to get there. But they also say, well, it's actually provided that the economic reforms continue. Eh, so I think it's a very good uh, symbol of the good work that you are doing, Senator, uh, in, in what you're doing today. I very much like your approach with regard to facts and figures. And I want to make one observation. I mean, the position papers by some of us they quote uh, BSP flow of investments. Um, now, whenever we quote figures of investments, we go for reported investments by the PSA. And the main reason is that if you look at the $10 billion, that actually includes $6 billion worth of debt instruments. Um, so even though these financial flows entered the Philippines, these did not necessarily go to job creative investments. They actually went to pay off other debts or other financial services, etc. Now, there's a lot of argumentation about which figures are the best ones. We normally use three sets as an EU. One is the flow set, so the BSP figures. One is the PSA figures, which look at all the reported investments by the uh, investment agencies, uh, so they add up actual uh, licenses given. And then we have our Eurostat figures, uh, but I'm more than happy to share with you those, just, just a caution on that one. Um, and then I have quite a number of points, I hope you don't mind. Um, the EU is the largest investor in the Philippines, if you look at those PSA figures, and actually if you look over the last five years, 24% of all incoming investments came from the European Union. It's our estimate that this created 500,000 jobs in the Philippines. If we look at our figures, our current stock of investment in the Philippines is roughly 10.5 billion euros. And I want immediately to link to your point, Senator, in terms of, well, do you have evidence on how well the Philippines is doing? Uh, we've seen the OECD and other kind of arguments. If I tell you that out of all the EU investments uh, to ASEAN, to the region, it's roughly 2.3% that ends up in the Philippines. Um, if you take uh, out of all our investments to the world, it's less than 0.1% that ends up in the Philippines. Now, if you would then compare that with parameters like the, the great uh, economy that you're having, uh, the population, the opportunities, then you can see there's an enormous mismatch in terms of our investments. For the EU, international investments are very important. Um, our investments into the EU are worth roughly 5.4 trillion, and our studies show that this uh, represents roughly 36% of the wealth created in the European Union. So these are foreign companies investing in the European Union. Likewise, uh, by the way, they create roughly 7.6 million jobs in the European Union. So we're actually very much welcoming foreign investments. Uh, the same for our companies. Our companies invest roughly 6.9 trillion euros uh, to the rest of the world. Um, and we, we believe that this supports 14.4 million jobs. Now, the benefits of investments go beyond profit-seeking. Huh? It's about job creation, it's about technology transfer, etc. I mean, I don't need to tell you that. Um, going to the Philippines, the observation that the Philippines could do a lot better, huh? despite recent growth and despite uh, European Union being very present here, I think if we take that into consideration, uh, we, we had a few points that we could add to the discussion. Uh, and some of them have already been mentioned here. Uh, first point is that the Philippines did extremely well, uh, my compliments to, to the government and, and Congress and the others, in the recent trade policy review in the WTO, uh, where actually it's a bit like the OECD review, uh, but they look at all the trade policy measures that the Philippines took in 2012, uh, the last review until today, 2017. Um, and WTO colleagues, including our own uh, European Union colleagues, were very kind of uh, acknowledging the good work that the Philippines has been doing in the various uh, reforms. 
Now, we would like to continue doing that in the context of WTO. I mean, today, if you look at the news, uh, there's a lot of kind of uh, countries or statesmen who actually try to deviate from WTO for whatever reason. Now, our argument as an EU is uh, let's try to keep into this int uh, international multilateral rule-based system because in the end it serves all of us. It, it relates to transparency, predictability, and, and rules-based. So whatever reforms you would want to look into, our first proposal would be to do that in a WTO context. And the Philippines is party to uh, what we call the General Agreement of Trade and Services, uh, but also, for instance, to WTO Agreement on Trade-Related Investment Measures. In that same, we would like to continue uh, we would like to suggest to the Philippines to consider joining the WTO government procurement agreement. Um, that doesn't come with any commitments so far. You can become a member as an observer, but it would cover one of your points you made, Senator, on the transparency issue. Uh, the GPA provides countries for certain requirements on, on how do you do procurements, how do you pr uh, publish them, etc. We would also welcome, if you're interested, to look at some of the forward thinking in the EU. I would expect in this meeting actually to be quite a lot of critical voices, which I haven't heard so far, about some of, for instance, civil society concerns. The EU has been working a lot on, for instance, changing the way we do investment to state dispute settlements, huh? which also here in the Philippines is one of the hot topics when it comes to investments from foreign countries, where we are actually we, we are changing the system into an investment court system, uh, a multilateral system with independent judges, with transparent proceedings, and we would really welcome the Philippines to be part of that uh, development. We also in the EU, um, and I stressed that point before, uh, we find it very important that governments have the right to regulate. Uh, so, for instance, when you do consider opening up for, for instance, uh, public utilities, uh, which is one of the, the draft laws uh, on the table, uh, make sure you do that in a way that it doesn't go at the expense, for instance, about the safety, the security, the availability for the Filipino people. Uh, so actually in our most recent trade agreements, for instance, with Canada, we made a very common understanding that even though the countries, uh, EU and Canada, opened up for public services, uh, that was with without any taking away of the government to have the right to regulate and even to renationalize if the government felt that was necessary. Uh, I think also very important in this discussion. Now coming to, to the Philippines, um, there's a couple of laws pending uh, and initiatives which we hope that also in this meeting, in this uh, forum, uh, you would like to champion, uh, Senator. Uh, one is on the government procurement laws. Um, we've heard a lot about that already, but I think if you want to have the build, build, build program executed, it's very important. Uh, you really need to look into how can you open it up more for foreign investments. Now, the very concrete one is on the PCAP requirements uh, that we already discussed at length, uh, but there the understanding is that you can actually open up for foreign companies without changing any of the legislation. So my first suggestion would be really to look into that, and I'm sure my colleagues from ECCP have a lot more to say about that. Uh, second, uh, the Senate Bill uh, Proposal 1754, uh, the, the proposed act amending public services, which basically looks at an, a, a different definition of public services uh, to take some of those more open uh, for, for foreign investment. We fully support that, especially since that proposed law also keeps the discretion of the government to decide whether or not you want to actually pursue foreign investment. Uh, so the only thing that the law does is to open up the possibility to attract foreign investors, for instance, in transportation, etc. But it doesn't impose the government to do so. Uh, so it's actually a very good way. Uh, the second one we discussed, and I think, Senator, you've been championing that as well, is the Retail Trade Act. I really appreciate the comments from you, sir, about you want to develop a region and people ask for retailers to be there. We had a very interesting debate about since the last retail liberalization, only 20 or so companies actually registered. Um, in, in Europe, retail is really one of the, the biggest sources of jobs. Huh? Uh, so it's beyond just providing uh, goods for people who come and shopping and tourists. It's also for the job creation. So we would strongly support, Senator, if you can pursue that one. Um, professional services. I really appreciate the comments made uh, by the PRC on this. I, I think there, uh, the, the last version of the negative list actually 
basically showed what was already there. Huh? I mean, these were already open uh, under reciprocity. But there, perhaps, and that links with the PIDS study, it's more about how you then implement it. Huh? One of the, co the, the feedback we get from European companies is that even though they are allowed to provide services, I think about construction, engineering, etc., they say it's so extremely difficult in terms of what they call the homologation of titles and accreditation to actually get the uh, permission to provide those services. Eh? So one thing is what's in the law, then the second thing is how can you facilitate to have these good people actually do a, do a job here. Another point before I come to an end, eh, sorry for being a bit long, is the constitution. I think whenever you talk with especially European industry, uh, but also people in the Philippines, they keep referring to the constitution as being one of the impediments of having foreign investment. Now, I would say, Senator, the challenge here is, when you look at the re review of the, the Foreign Investment Act, is, I, I, I mean, I'm coming from uh, an economy that really relies very heavily on the open investment regime, uh, for good reasons. Um, my, my challenge to you, sir, would be to bring the Philippines to that next level, uh, let's say upper middle income level, uh, which could be within two to six, seven years, uh, but you can fast track that process uh, as part of your pro-poor agenda um, to see what, what you can do within the FIA amendment, whatever is possible within the bounds of the Constitution in terms of liberalization. And, and the suggestion would be here to be as bold as possible, and I welcome your suggestion for research with PIDS and NEDA, and if you want to have any of our kind of uh, contributions to that, uh, more than happy to give that. I mean, for sure, the capitalization requirements, um, the, the, the issue on transparency that you mentioned before. In our FTAs, for instance, we got criticism from the European SMEs, providing 98% of the jobs in Europe, saying that we cannot benefit of the FTAs. And we actually made sure that we changed our FTAs to make sure that they could benefit. Now, the capital requirements might sound low when you talk about the multinational companies, even from Europe, but those are not the ones you are looking for, because those are the ones who are already here, most of them. What you want to look at is what are the 98% SMEs in Europe or other parts of the world who find the Philippines still a little bit too difficult to invest in. Huh? So, so my, my, my invitation or challenge would be to, to be ambitious in the revamping of the FIA. Uh, I'm very happy with some of the feedback I, I hear here. Um, um, and I'm more than happy also to share, I if you think it's interesting, more about our forward thinking in Europe. Uh, again, investment is a very tricky issue when it talks about statistics, it talks about jobs, it talks about foreign ownership, so we realize that. But I think uh, I, I appreciate your first point, look at the facts and the figures and base your assessment on that one. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Van Hattem. I, I just have a little... Um, have some questions uh, in the FINL um, you mentioned some industries like retail um, professional services but what other what are the uh, I'm, I've asked this before now what are the low-hanging fruits from the EU perspective that we can take advantage right away you know, um, I, I know some of the industries here that uh, if we you know, liberalize them you know, fix the law what are the what are the priority sectors here in the list that we can take advantage right away and we can uh, uh, um, you know, have high impact uh, to our economy? No, no, thanks Thanks very much for that question, sir. I, I think in low-hanging fruits, I really like, for instance, the suggestion of PESA um, and, and then coming back to the discussion we had on the OECD restrictiveness, uh, 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 the part also by PIDS. Um, my argument when I met the colleagues from the OECD was that you take a very legalistic point of view on the Philippines. Um, because if you would actually consider the PESA and the regimes that are there, um, there is a lot of FDI going to the Philippines, uh, despite the legal restrictions, because the PESA offers them an opportunity uh, to, to have a much better kind of liberal treatment. Uh, now, the point made of those companies that operate in PESA, and, and Florian can say but more, because a lot of them are members of the ECCP, is that what they regret is that, yes, they have a great environment within the PESA, but they cannot sell those products within the Philippines, I think up to 30%. Huh? Now, if, for instance, you could, with an easy change of, I don't know if that's feasible, 
extend that 30% to let's say 40, 50 or even 60%, you create a PESA environment for foreign investors. They are really happy in the PESAs, the feedback we get, uh, with the ability to take advantage of the upcoming growth market. Now another example is on green energy, where you know, I don't know if this is actually in the FINL, but it is in the energy uh, law, uh, where European companies, very big on, on green energy, are not allowed uh, in, in, in parts of that industry. Now, if you open that up, you would have a dual benefit, uh, because for one, uh, the Senate ratified the climate change agreement, and we are very happy that you did so. You could actually fulfill some of these requirements on emissions by getting your energy mix, and we, we had a discussion on that, so I hope you don't get, uh, but, but you, you know where I'm coming from, but actually you could then get more foreign investments into that. that. That's one area where Europe would be very interested in. Uh, transport, logistics, uh, maritime industry, aviation. Yesterday we had a great event with President Duterte uh, with the Philippine Airlines where a number of Airbuses uh, were being sold or, or presented. Um, it's one industry where some of that Airbus is actually produced, as you know, in the Philippines. Huh? Uh, we are extremely proud of the Philippine capacity. We are now building, I had a meeting with uh, your IMO ambassador, uh, Ambassador Salinas, who says they are now building up a center. We have the, uh, uh, we, we have the Lufthansa Technique, who is actually recruiting people to, to build skills, uh, these are Filipinos, on, on airline maintenance. Now, the idea is to do something similar on captains. On, on, uh, you are extremely big on, on seafarers, as you know, a lot of them in Europe, but actually to see if we can also build their skills on aviation, on becoming pilots. We are having a project on that one. Now, these are examples, I mean, just off my uh, s sleeves, I'm happy to look into more detail, but I think all of these areas could present you with a case where if you have to say, why do you want to liberalize investment? Because you can then actually have evidence of what are the good kind of benefits for the Filipino people and the Filipino economy of it. Huh? If I come from a European interest, then I would sum up uh, services is for us very important. Most of our economy is no longer in, in manufacturing, in the production of goods. It's about e-commerce. Huh? How can you make it easier to do banking? Well, there's some work has been done already. Um, retail, very important for us, uh, etc. Thank you, Mr. Van Hattem. And uh, uh, Earlier we talked about transparency you know, and in the PIDS paper. There are also non-equity restrictions. No? Um, have you encountered this type of restrictions? What industries and what type of restrictions are they? I, I, I think, I mean, w one of your champions, which, which I regard very highly, is, is Bill Luce, eh, who, who used to head the National Competitive uh, Council, um, who's been looking at, for instance, ease of doing business. And now you just adopted a very important law in that field. Eh? Um, I, I think one of the OECD uh, uh, I, I think guidance is also on how many licenses do you need to obtain before you can actually establish a business. I think the requirements, I mean, if I make a, I'm, I'm a trade policy person, huh? so we negotiate trade deals to bring tariffs down, as you know, eh, because that makes it cheaper for products to be imported and exported. But our modern trade deals are no longer about tariffs. It's all about the business environment that you establish so that your companies have a global supply chain possibility. Uh, so you can purchase part of your Airbus in Indonesia, we do that, part of that in the Philippines, part of the technology perhaps from France, even from the US, etc. So you want to facilitate that part. Now, if you want to do that, you must make it very easy for companies to establish. Huh? Um, so I think a number of measures were already mentioned. I mean, the professional service is very important. Um, I don't think the Europeans want to compete here with Filipinos in terms of jobs, but you might have companies thinking about high-tech industry like Airbus or green energy that say, well, actually, we want to be able to get people that we educated in Europe that have the latest kind of uh, professional skills to be able to work here in the Philippines on some of these projects. Huh? Um, it's not about numbers, I would say. It's probably more about uh, the, the, the one or the other really technical guy or girl who can do that specific jobs. Um, and I think PIDS in their point three or four mentioned also, it's not just about the restrictions, it's actually about having the climate that would actually allow these companies to thrive here. Yeah. So Mr. Van Houten, what you're saying is if we address the uh, red tape, no? which is the ease of doing business, um, uh, which is ease of doing business, and then we 
remove equity restrictions here in the FINL. Um, this will improve the investment climate here in the Philippines. And hopefully we can increase uh, the pie to ASEAN um, from 2.3%. Hopefully we can, can we, can we raise it to 50% from, uh, because we're only getting less than, uh, this, this is only a single figure. But uh, what my point is, how do we get the bigger slice of the pie? You know, that's, that's my point. And you're just saying you know, red tape, which we address through a, a new law, uh, we're now addressing you know, equity restrictions by this discussion. Hopefully, we'll file um, amendments uh, subsequently. Uh, are these the only two things uh, so that we can the only two things we should address so that we can increase the pie uh, coming in the Philippines? Thanks. I, I really like your questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator. No, because if you want to have my, my kind of personal answer, I think it needs a mindset change in the Philippines, eh, with all respect. Um, so you can change one or the other things. I mean, one thing, for instance, one of the laws that was adopted was the cabotage law, which actually, in a way, sets the Philippines out in terms of your peers in ASEAN, eh, because most of them don't have such a liberal cabotage provision. However, and, and the colleagues from the chamber who are much more in direct contact with the companies, if you then look at the application of it, it doesn't actually do what it was intended to do. Um, so the question might not be about how much do we need to change. You would need to change that, I think, if you want to get a bigger pie. But it's also about the mindset. Compare yourselves with your peers in the region. Look at Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam, uh, roughly the same size economy as the Philippines, I think, in terms of GDP. Um, trade with the EU, I think, is four to five times as high. Um, FDI from the EU, but also two ways, I think, is at least double, if I'm correct. But I, 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 I should check my figures. Vietnam has been very ambitiously trying to look after us with an FTA, for instance. Eh? They've been coming after us uh, every day of, of the, well, sort of. Eh? So, and, and that's about the EU, but I do that with other countries as well. So I, I think it's, apart from looking at the concrete measures, it's also about a mindset change about some of the champions of your industry, and, and I don't want to mention them by name here, but you have a number of champions who are also, for instance, investing a lot in Europe, who know what is the business of global supply chains, is I would say carefully listening. They're not here, by the way, but I'm, I mean, you might want to have a separate session with, with your own industry, uh, with Philippine uh, industry, uh, because some of them have a mindset where they realize that if they want to stay in business over the next two decades, the only way of doing that is to go out there, uh, no longer to be confined into your protected market of the Philippines. And I think some of those champions can perhaps help you with that mindset change. I, I'm sorry, I'm a bit philosophical, huh, but I, I think you need to tap into the concrete measures, but you also might want to have a discussion within the Senate and beyond about is it good for the Philippines to really roughly, to really drastically change your, your kind of investment regime. Uh, in Europe, we are the most open economy in terms of procurement, uh, government procurement, everybody's welcome and investment. We are getting back a little bit of that. Huh? Uh, because we feel like we are so open that, I mean, we give subsidies for people to build roads. These subsidies go to companies from our competitors, and some of these roads don't fulfill the right standards. I mean, we had issues with a number of member states there. Um, so some of the member states are getting a little bit more cautious about the openness, so we do reflect on that. On investment, we now are building a, a, a proposal on investment screening. Uh, so basically, we still want to be as open as we are. But we want to look a little bit more on strategic sectors. Uh, you mentioned defense industry, uh, but you can also think about R&D, uh, really kind of strategic industries. Do you want a company or a state-owned enterprise from one of your competitors to buy in a company that is very high on IPR? And uh, we are having that debate now in Europe. So it's not very naive saying we want to open up for everybody at all times. But I think it's about being very deep in terms of we want to reap the benefits of this openness eh, by making sure that we get as much foreign investment, the kind of foreign investment that we like, as, as possible. So it's a bit philosophical, but I hope it Thank helps. you. Thank you. Uh, next is European Chamber. Any one of you? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for the invitation and for a very interesting discussion so far. And uh, basically, a lot of things have been said already. So. Um, it's always difficult uh, when you're one of the last ones being uh, asked about to share your comments. 
uh, without reiterating what has already been discussed, uh, especially from Walter. I think um, we're working as European Chamber uh, very closely uh, together with the European Union and chair most of uh, the points uh, Walter has um, just um, presented to you. Um, nevertheless, just me let me let's just wear also the head of the Joint Foreign Chambers and uh, reiterate the Joint Foreign Chambers are basically seven different chambers, Japanese Chamber, Korean Chamber, American Chamber, Australian Chamber, Canadian Chamber, European Chamber, and Pomuri, which is the um, organization of the regional operating headquarters here in the Philippines. And altogether, we uh, represent about 3,000 uh, member companies engaged in about 100 billion US dollars worth of trade and some 30 billion US dollars worth of investment here in the Philippines. Um, we are very much aligned with the 10-point socio-economic agenda of the um, administration and uh, as such we also are very um, happy to join such hearings. Uh, we have also been joining hearings on the pickup, on uh, retail, uh, PSA, etc., etc. So I think uh, it, it's, it's for us um, a very um, useful um, tool to also bring our observations, our comments across. And um, I think let me just highlight maybe a few. I think it doesn't make sense to, to, to run through our position paper again because uh, most of the numbers where the Philippine ranks in different uh, studies have been mentioned already. But uh, let me just go back to a couple of things and for us as a uh, business organizations, it all boils down to competition. It doesn't matter to uh, which um, industry, which sector you're looking at. I mean, if it's construction industry, we have been discussing it already. Uh, we have also been attending the PCAP uh, hearing um, of uh, Congressman Arta Yap before. Um, it all boils down to competition. If you open it up, um, I think we, we all want to contribute to this quite ambitious uh, build, build, build program. I think we have identified bottlenecks. We have heard it from various um, government agencies, including TBWH, also in that previous hearing on, on PCAP. We have heard it here again. I think we are really uh, eager to, to, to um, contribute there. Same goes for retail, uh, telecommunications. Transportation, as highlighted by Walter, um, just to give you an example, I mean, we are, as European Chamber, we also have offices in, uh, in uh, not only here in Metro Manila, but also we have an office in Cebu City, an office in Davao, and in Cagayan de Oro. And when I talk to our colleagues in Cagayan de Oro, they're actually complaining that uh, sending a, a container uh, by ship from uh, Cagayan de Oro to Manila costs them as much as sending that uh, <coughs> container from Manila to Europe. So. I mean, maybe you can also ask your uh, colleague, Senator Sabiri. I think he's also very well aware of uh, that fact. Also, when it comes to the energy sector, I think we, we see a lot of um, development here now with amendments in the PSA Act, with the, the Retail Trade Act. So I we are really um, eager to, to, to contribute to that and see actually more in the coming uh, month. Thank you, Mr. Gatten. Um, you, you mentioned earlier construction, I think. Um, do you have any... Um, uh, anecdotes uh, relating to this, uh, you know, any interested uh, um, companies uh, who's looking at the Philippines, but uh, because of uh, restrictions, uh, they they decline to uh, come in. Yeah. Any any can I mean hear without, um, yeah, without some anecdotes? Without naming any uh, names here now, um, it's uh, actually a European company which has teamed up with a local uh, partner already with one of the leading uh, construction or developers here in the country uh, to um, execute some um, some high-rise, uh, I think, mixed uh, commercial and residential um, uh, projects here in, in Makati. And I think um, both are really happy about this, um, about the synergies, and especially the Filipino part was looking, uh, was actually um, looking for contractors here in the country to develop under certain international standards, uh, et cetera, et cetera, but nobody was actually able to uh, comply with those uh, requirements. And then uh, this European company came in and showed with their technology that it's really doable <coughs> to do that. So that's in the private sector. And I think uh, when you look at the uh, government uh, or public uh, works, um, especially when you look at uh, Clark, we heard from uh, in the last meeting the Joint Foreign Chambers had with um, the UF Secretary Dominguez, he was actually pointing at us and where are you guys? Um, there was no international uh, company actually uh, bidding for that. Uh, so what's the issue? And I think it goes directly in this direction. It, it goes really in this direction. Why should a European or a international company come in with its technology, maybe also with um, with a majority of uh, the uh, needed money to invest here, and then only can control 40% of that? So I think in there were <coughs> there might have been some examples in the past. 
where um, investors have burned their fingers here. So you know, it's 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 might yeah, there might be it, be it must be a mixture of, of both experience, what has happened to uh, companies operating in the country here before. Uh, I think especially when it comes to airports, um, but also um, that uh, from a European perspective, the Philippines are geographically still far away. So we have other um, priority markets, may it be uh, in Africa, may it be in, uh, in uh, the Middle East, may it be um, in, in South America. But uh, I think all those uh, measures you're, under, you're doing now also with uh, especially the Ease of Doing Business Act to become by and large more attractive for foreign investments is definitely uh, the right thing to do. And I think uh, also what Walter was saying, it's also about the mindset. I mean, you have 10 million of your um, fellow Filipinos working abroad. They are experienced, exposed to a different mindset in Europe, in the US, etc. I think you should also take advantage of that, bring them back, and you know, this, this mindset will then happen. So your story okay. earlier that the uh, DOF asked you uh, what happened, <laughs> how come nobody participated. Yeah. Yeah, w w what you're saying is uh, if we remove that fourth, uh, that uh, twenty-five percent restriction, mm. um, then we will spur interest from major construction companies to participate in the uh, build, build, build program. Yeah. Uh, and you have you have um, you know you have uh, serious entities who are willing to participate in the build, build, build program. Uh, let's call it that way. It makes it easier for us to promote the Philippines or the opportunities we see here in the Philippines to those companies. Because we can say, okay, you can invest here, but you also can control your investment. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Mr. Um, or the Japanese Chamber, yeah. Shirtago. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Florian. That basically, you know, the joint chamber of commerce comment that he already forwarded. And, uh, of course, you know, the big difference from Europe and the Japan, Japan is well, very close to Philippines. So we put priority to make investment in Philippines. But anyhow, a little bit for, you know, the, some of the concern of foreign investment uh, actually already been discussed at early stage by DTI together with NEDA. And uh, actually the position of the Japanese Chamber of Commerce already forwarded this to uh, DTI on last February. Uh, one of most critical issues, exactly the same with, you know, the position paper of the Korean Chamber of Commerce, this is for the retail trade. Uh, even though 100% for the retail investment is allow allowed, but still, you know, the, there is a, a, well, very strict, you know, the criteria. One of the critical issues is $2.5 million uh, paid up capital. And also, you know, the minimum invest per shop it for, you know, the 830,000 U.S. dollars. So what, you know, the both Korean Chamber of Commerce and also Japan Chamber of Commerce requesting to reduce to the 200,000 U.S. dollars. Yeah, obviously we do not intend to, you know, the his to Filipino middle or the small price enterprise. But by decreasing those kind of minimum paid up capital to decrease to 200, uh, 200,000 U.S. dollars, I do not feel that may be affect to the small or the medium class for the Philippine investment. And uh, the other point is, of course, you know, the, uh, like a national utility issue. Uh, of course, national utility, that it rather better to be governed by the Philippine company. Uh, some area, is, I'm sure about it. But one of the good examples is like a renewable power energy. Coal or the, uh, like a diesel power plant can be allowed for the 100% owned by the foreigner. But like, you know, the solar power or the wind power, which may not be affecting to like a national issue in Philippines, but still, you know, the foreigner still restrict to only to the 40%. And uh, so far, this kind of solar or the uh, wind power plant, uh, like there are, you know, the several Philippine company approach to uh, Japanese company for joint investment. But you know, the, our question is how come whether you are ready to invest 60% for the equity? So in this sense, I also have a preference to release. It's not necessarily 40%, but you know, the foreigner can invest more for those area. And the other one is, of course, you know, the construction that already been discussed in many area. Uh, surely, uh, you know, the, like a low-tech construction, it's not necessary to open to foreign investment or the foreign contractor. But specific for those kind of, you know, the 
uh, special technology required construction, we have a preference that you know the, it make easier to release the licenses. And the issue is, you know, the uh, picture with the Philippine authority is well very difficult to release for you know the licenses. So we try to point it out three media. One is a leader, and the other one is you know the national resources or the national utility definition, and the other one is for to release some specific construction area. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Um, Sago. So uh, bad, no? In the uh, I met, I I heard um, some restrictions in renewable energy. No, pero wala siya sa FINL. But I know for a fact that uh, for renewable energy, it's only maximum of 40 percent because of constitutional uh, restriction. No, it's considered. The sun and the wind is considered a natural resource. No? So, but wala siya dito sa FINL. Uh, I'm informed, uh, Mr. Chair, that it is under the use of natural resource. Yeah. Under sa sun use of natural resource. Yes, okay, sir. Okay, dun siya pumapasok. Yes, sir. Uh, Next is uh, FEF, Secretary Thevis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Attorney Joseph Angeles to my right, and I are representing the FEF. Uh, can I issue our statement? And yes, yes, sir. We, the Foundation for Economic Freedom, strongly support calls for calls to review and revise Philippine investment laws to attract more foreign investments that will generate more and better quality jobs. Foreign direct investments, or FDIs, will also provide the domestic economy with new sources of capital, technology transfer, and increased competition to help attain more inclusive growth and development. While FDI inflows to the Philippines increased to $10 billion in 2017, 21.4% higher than the previous year, we still pale in comparison with ASEAN peers like Singapore and Indonesia, whose FDI flows reached $63.5 billion and $22 billion respectively over the same period. This is because the Philippine economy remains restrictive <laughs> compared to our ASEAN neighbors. The 11 Foreign Investments Negative List, or FINL, which is pending approval of the NED Board, is perceived to be the most liberal, liberalized FINL yet based on, this, on its draft. We welcome this development. However, restrictions on foreign ownership cannot all be removed administratively, as several, as several prohibitions need legislative actions or constitutional amendments. In this regard, the FEF recommends the following low-hanging fruits for the Senate and the House of Representatives to seriously consider. Number one, amend the 1936 Public Service Act to provide a clear definition of a public utility. FEF supports the immediate passage of this bill into law. Competition and foreign investments are inhibited because of limitations such as the 60-40 rule in the operation of a public utility as provided in the Constitution. It's currently applied to all public services instead of just public utilities. By defining what a public utility is, several industries listed as public service, for example, transport, telco, power, will be freed up from the foreign restriction that will then result in new capital, more competition, better quality, and more efficient delivery of these services. Number two, resolution of both houses. Number two, proposing amendments to certain economic provisions of the 1987 Constitution particularly on Articles 12, 14, and 16 by Congressman Feliciano Belmonte. The insertion of the phrase, quote, unless otherwise provided by law, unquote, in certain provisions of the Constitution means that the provisions are not fixed, but rather flexible, and can be further defined by laws that will need to be legislated by Congress. A study group composed of volunteer FES fellows have a similar proposal 
to other phrase, quote, unless otherwise subsequently provided by law, unquote, to fully liberalize and lift all restrictions unless Congress in the future decides to impose restrictions by law. Number three, moreover, the current exercise of amending the charter to a federal form of government should be taken as an opportunity to amend the economic provisions in the Constitution. Amend or remove provisions that no longer accommodate the effects of modernization and globalization, such as those on foreign ownership of land and the use of natural resources, foreign equity in the, part in the operation of a public utility, mass media and advertising, and the foreign practice of professions. By serving as, a constitu as constitutional limitations, some of these economic provisions have adversely affected the Philippine economy over the years as binding constraints to inclusive growth and development. Incidentally, a recent Supreme Court decision declaring that the just share of local government units must be computed and sourced from all national taxes, not just from national internal revenue taxes, should push the government to aim for a significantly higher level of FDIs. The ruling means less funds for the national government's programs and projects, as it will now also have to share with LGUs the proceeds from franchise fees, customs duties, and other revenue sources it did not share before. Further, our balance of trade and current account deficit are increasing. If the Philippines does not want the peso to fall too far in relation to the U.S. dollar and also not be reliant on foreign loans, we should endeavor to attract more FDIs to finance the country's growing, account, growing current account deficit. For a developing country like the Philippines, there is much to be gained from opening up the economy and taking full participation in the global market. Removing restrictions on foreign investments is a necessary first step to get the fundamentals right, but further delaying the amendments will also further delay our opportunity at development. As such, legisl the legislator's prompt action on the matter is early sought. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, if there's time, can we comment on some of your concerns? Yes, yes. go ahead, Secretary. One is uh, you con your concern on the Build, Build, Build program. And if I heard you correctly, uh, there seems to be uh, concern on the capacity of the public works uh, because they probably have reached their capacity to further implement uh, some of these big uh, infrastructure projects. Is that correct, Mr. Chairman? Um, uh, I, was, I was trying to uh, solicit some anecdotes from the implementers themselves, such as BCDA, um, on what are their experiences okay. in undertaking major uh, flagship projects. No? Because yeah. this morning, I remember uh, watching uh, the Secretary of Public Works, and one of the reasons that he cited for the delays is because of the lack of local constructor contractors who can undertake uh, government projects. Yeah. In other words, it's either they've reached capacity or because we are undertaking such a huge uh, endeavor that we don't have that, uh, the number of contractors who can actually participate in that type of uh, major projects. Yeah, well, assuming his uh, observation is correct, uh, we would welcome, of course, uh, the uh, private sector getting more involved in the, the build, build, build programs of the government in an earlier discussion with some of our government officials, we suggested that to the extent that some of these projects that were intended to be funded by the government have not yet actually been funded, then maybe the private sector can come in to participate in these projects, freeing up those resources intended for these projects to some other recent concerns of the government. No? We did not see, anticipate more than a year ago the problems that were we faced in Marawi, the demands for uh, additional compensation for the soldiers, and some other requests. You know. We would also welcome uh, uh, what has been discussed earlier, more uh, 
participation from uh, foreign contractors, including uh, international consultants. Uh, the the issue of um, unsolicited proposals, uh, I think was voiced by the president uh, as reported in the papers, would also be a welcome development. Uh, some of the projects uh, that may be necessary <laughs> may not have been included yet in the previous development programs of the government. So to the extent that uh, the private sector can come in via these unsolicited proposals, bringing in international consultants and uh, also foreign contractors would probably be a welcome uh, alternative if there are already constraints from our own domestic contractors. Mm -hmm. uh, on the ease of doing business, uh, on par par particularly on the issue of transparency and global uh, competition, uh, competitive index, um, Attorney Angeles will amplify a little bit more on this, uh, Mr. Chairman, particularly on Section 12 of the Republic Act 11032, ease of uh, doing business. And basically, he also mentioned, Mr. Chairman, that what are the other factors other than foreign equity um, that should be considered? Actually, there are really n a number of other factors. Some of them are non-economic uh, that will have to be addressed. Uh, complementary to the economic factors. Uh, I think this is already uh, well known that uh, issues like uh, perceived or real corruption uh, should probably be addressed and maybe toned down. <coughs> the issue of peace and order uh, would probably be would very, very important. On these government contracts, uh, rather infrastructure projects, uh, if the government can handle the right-of-way problem uh, much faster, unfortunately, we are a more challenged country when it, is, when it comes to the judicial process. The dem democratic process is uh, a bit more challenging than what Vietnam and China are faced with when it comes to right-of-way problems. You know. The issue of level playing field, the issue of uh, honoring contracts, I think uh, should be something that the government can continuously review whether uh, this is really being implemented properly. So it's really a combination. And interestingly, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Chairman, that <coughs> can we come up with uh, some estimate on to what extent it would foreign equity, uh, the issue of foreign equity addressed? Uh, what is the, that contribution to the overall, uh, let's say, economy. It's not an easy task, but it's an interesting task. But my own little observation of this, Mr. Chairman, it's really a combination of these factors. And like a thesis would say, foreign equity investment, whole other factors constant. The reality is these other factors are not going to be constant. The issue of foreign equity can have a dramatic effect on these other factors, so they reinforce each other rather than taking one factor in isolation. I think for our country, the issue of foreign equity will have a dramatic effect on the other factors, and therefore, in fact, doubling or even exponentially increasing our growth and development. Because we're one of the few countries in the world wherein we put limitations on foreign equity or restrictions on foreign equity in the Constitution itself. Many countries do not have this. So we don't have that kind of flexibility. And it's ingrained in the minds of foreign investors that we are a very restrictive country. So taking this out in the, economic, in the Constitution will have such a dramatic effect. And as I mentioned, will have a reinforcing effect on the other factors as well. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I turn over to Attorney Angeles on the East Maybe Point. the Secretary, instead of um, a People's Initiative on postponing the election, uh, People's Initiative in taking out the uh, economic restrictions in the Constitution. <laughs> I think there's a planned uh, People's Initiative, no? but uh, I think a more productive use of that uh, energy is really taking out the economic restrictions in the Constitution. I, I would agree with that. In fact, considering the complexity of the 1987 <laughs> Constitution, and recent surveys still indicate that the people are not yet prepared for 
a radical change in the Constitution, I, as, uh, as, as I think a minimum that should probably be welcomed by the people is concentrate first on the economic provisions of the Constitution. If we can have that approved and included in the 2019 plebiscite, that will have a very positive effect on the perception of the public as well as the international investors uh, in, in our country. No. Thank you, Secretary. Attorney Angeles. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Um, actually, a lot of the points that I, I uh, intended to raise were uh, mentioned by our colleagues here already. Uh, let me just try to reinforce some of the points that were mentioned by them. Uh, first, um, as regards determinants of economic growth, one, uh, our, our colleague from the PIDS rightly mentioned uh, the restrictions that the, the indices of restrictions in the OECD. And another thing that we could, could also be referred to would be the WF Global Competitiveness Index, uh, which measures uh, national competitiveness. And uh, why do I mention this? Uh, because uh, there's, uh, there are studies which show that this is uh, correlated with future growth. And uh, we can see very clearly that uh, the competitive uh, economies in those regions perform much better than those that are uh, le uh, less competitive on this index. Uh, on the next slide, we can see that uh, there are a number of uh, factors that tie into, what I uh, into this global competitiveness index. Uh, for factor-driven economies, these are what are the most important and efficiency-driven economies and innovation-driven economies. The Philippines is classified uh, as on the cusp of becoming efficiency-driven. Uh, and what our discussion today, uh, our discussions today tie very closely to a number of these pillars, especially on infrastructure, uh, labor market efficiency, and so on. Uh, we can, we can, uh, and I can, I can show this later on uh, the next slide. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, our, some of our colleagues here mentioned about uh, change in mindset. Uh, it's very clear that the Philippines has, is in fact uh, less uh, competitive on the average versus our colleagues in the region. And in fact, uh, Vietnam has increased in competitiveness while if you look at our uh, competitiveness, we have dipped slightly over time. And uh, I, I suppose one way to, to, to think about this is we are in a race and we are already slightly behind. And uh, if we are uh, to lap them in that race, we have to run faster, certainly. We are, we're certainly we are uh, doing some things correctly. Uh, this idea of build, build, build certainly is, is going to uh, help things. The Ease of Doing Business Act uh, the intended reforms in Public Service Act and so on will help, but we do need to run faster and there, there needs to be, uh, th there is that, uh, that um, impetus and certainly urgency for this. Uh, next, in terms of how we perform on uh, various indices, it can be seen, especially in the infrastructure side, we perform quite uh, poorly and uh, we can certainly do better. And that's why, uh, again, uh, our, uh, this, the, the, the build, build, build plan certainly fits very uh, closely with that. And uh, in fact, in f as, as mentioned in the Global Competitiveness Index, especially in, uh, as regards infrastructure, this is critical for ensuring the effective functioning of the economy, effective modes of transport, enable entrepreneurs to get their goods and services to market in a secure and timely manner. Economies that also depend on electricity supplies that are free from interruptions and shortages so that businesses and factories can work unimpeded. And finally, a solid and extensive telecommunications network that allows for rapid and free flow of information, which increases overall economic efficiency. Now, how does this tie to our discussion today? Uh, next slide, uh, next up after that. Uh, again, if our infrastructure on this, in this global competitiveness index, I underlined very clearly how this ties to that. Uh, infrastructure, quality of electricity supply, uh, next slide. Uh, prevalence of trade barriers, prevalence of foreign ownership restrictions, business of impact of rules on FDI, and so on. 
Next. The country capacity to retain talent, which again is tied to what restrictions there are on exercise of profession and so on. Next. What is the, so again, uh, what is FDI good in the first place? Yes, it is. Uh, there is a positive and statistically significant association with this FDI and foreign equity ownership restrictions. This has been shown by various studies, including those by the World Bank and OECD. <laughs> and part of that is also explained by other restrictions on ownership and corporate control, because especially in countries where there are higher transaction costs, control is very important. Corporate control is very important. Uh, there was also mention of n uh, non-equity restrictions. There are some restrictions in place also as regards management. This is also very important. In fact, there are a number of studies which show that choice of CEO, for example, or for that matter, the board, is very highly correlated with firm performance. So restricting the choice of restrict, uh, equity ownership in itself is already uh, uh, onerous, and at the same time, restricting uh, um, choice of uh, management is even more so. Uh, it certainly uh, uh, does not help at all. It, in fact, increases the perceived risks to investors. And in the end, when people make investments, it's whether, in fact, there is a post, uh, positive net present value to be gained from that investment. And whether that, and especially if you have other choices, is there positive net present value higher than those other choices? particularly if you are to make them, let, if, if you have other choices, let's say, as Vietnam or so on in the, in the area. So, uh, next. Um, it may also be seen that uh, this is from UNCTAD, and uh, there is an inexorable trend towards liberalization and, and, or, and uh, in terms of regulatory changes. Fr and this is from 2002 to 2016. Uh, next. Um, so, uh, Moving on, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I think this was discussed earlier by our colleagues. Uh, next. Um, uh, sorry, go back one slide. There. Um, so, as regards the Foreign Investments Act, uh, our, our colleague from the SEC and our other colleagues here mentioned that correctly that the FIA, uh, in some cases, just reiterates what is stated in the Constitution and other statutes. and. Uh, in some cases, it also provides for administrative restrictions by presidential proclamation upon uh, endorsement or recommendation of NEDA. And if we are to amend the Foreign Investments Act alone, uh, yes, it might tackle the aspects of the uh, administrative uh, restrictions, but they rightly pointed out that uh, express repeal of these uh, other restrictions in uh, of other statutes would be uh, would be better because uh, implied because of the implied repeal rule. Uh, I'd also uh, it would also be good to point out uh, 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 as regards uh, and then as regards uh, uh, the pub, uh, public service act that can be done through uh, definition of what a public utility means. So. Again, in sum, uh, it's good to tie, I think our colleagues rightly pointed out that it's appropriate to tie these to, to, these, to, these, uh, to this kind of mindset that there are other uh, investment destinations. We do need to uh, make our country more preferable versus these other destinations. We have made some progress, but we do need to, there is uh, certainly uh, it's certainly important to move more, to move even more quickly in this regard. Uh, are there low-hanging fruit? Uh, I believe uh, this was mentioned earlier. Public Service Act, perhaps, uh, as regards uh, making it easier for contractors to come in, given the 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 we have really reached apparently the limit of the capacity of existing contractors. That would certainly help, as mentioned earlier, to address our infrastructure gap which is clearly identified in the Global Competitiveness Index. Um, as regards transparency, uh, it was meant perhaps that might, that might, be, might possibly be addressed by this Ease of Doing Business uh, Act under Section 13 Central Business Portal Rule. 
uh, that might help as regards the uh, making it the requirements clear to all concerned. Um, and certainly, uh, it would even be uh, more helpful if the constitutional amendments on lifting these uh, economic restrictions would e be even uh, would be even more helpful. Um, it's notable that in the proposed um, constitutional changes, uh, there was a statement about uh, there's a, there was a proviso of unless uh, to, to the gist saying unless otherwise provided by law, but the management was still reserved to Filipinos. And uh, again, that does impose additional risks which uh, on, on investors which would, uh, well, frankly, uh, uh, would not help in, in would, would, would be less helpful uh, in, in this aim to attract more foreign direct investment. Uh, that would be all, your, uh, Mr. Chair. Attorney, thank you. Thank you very much. Attorney, I, I just have a question. No? I think the spirit really of having this uh, FINL is to protect um, local entrepreneurs, local uh, businessmen, uh, make sure that uh, the uh, Filipino businessmen in specific industries, in specific sectors are protected and uh, they will not be um, subjected to um, you know, intense competition that can lead to their, um, to, to, to lead to their demise. Um, definitely if you, you know, liberalize, you know, if, you, if we liberalize these sectors here in the FINL, um, there's this fear that they will be clobbered one day by you know, bigger, uh, better capitalized uh, entities and um, you know, certain sectors might uh, even be uh, controlled by foreign entities. No? Um, is, there, is, is, that, is that fear founded or is that at this present day and age, uh, do you think uh, our industries still needs that protection? Um, well, Your Honor, um, one, uh, first, uh, I think that as it is, we're uh, really quite restrictive as we can already see from the rules. In fact, I another have another um, uh, table which shows uh, from the World Bank that versus the just the international norm, we are uh, in terms of foreign equity restrictions. We're really quite it's really quite high as compared to what are uh, 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 versus even just the average. Um, um, as regards. Uh, 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 your mention about uh, whether um, uh, protection of, of small entrepreneurs or so on. Um, perhaps another way to look at it, Your Honor, would be uh, consumer welfare. And as mentioned by our colleagues at the Philippine Competition Commission, uh, increased competition does redound to consumer welfare in terms of higher quality and reduced prices. Uh, on the other note, uh, I think that the SEC also mentioned that the amount of $100,000 as it is, is actually quite, uh, uh, is, is, is already, uh, already quite uh, sufficient to meet, if, if that is your concern, Your Honor. The, the two, sorry, the $200,000 restriction is, is already quite high in itself. And uh, certainly that needs to be reconsidered too. Um, yes, Your Honor. That, that's Chair the Chairman. other side of the coin. I mean, uh, uh, you want to... Uh, um, the example is not exactly um, close to what you're saying, but I w I'm going to give an example, Mr. Chairman, of uh, one industry which was... Uh, included and, and then li later liberalized through the foreign investment negative list. And this is uh, bank liberalization. You know. In 1992, Mr. Chair, uh, we had two versions, the House version and the Senate version. The House version um, wanted a clear liberalization, uh, full entry of foreign banks. The Senate version did not want this kind of uh, liberal entry type, no? 
So in the end, we had a compromise. In the end, we had allowed 10 foreign banks to come in. But the, the objectives are similar to what uh, Thorny Ang Angela said. It's really for the benefit of, of the consumers, the borrowers, and even the employees of banks. No? More than 20 years later, um, the bank industry is completely liberalized. All the foreign banks who want to come in can actually come in, you know, subject to, of course, uh, BSP regulations. But it only suggests and proves that over time, because of interdependence, what is happening in the world, uh, digital age, all of these elements taken together, we have to adapt to uh, international conditions. And um, what we're trying to protect eventually is really the greater welfare of a larger number of people. So if that is the mindset, uh, competition, as also indicated by our colleagues, will spur efficiency among our own uh, domestic uh, manufacturers, uh, service providers, and so on. So that is what I'm saying, that if we just start and in this case, uh, a lot of people are asking us, why is it that the Philippines still has these economic restrictions in the Constitution? Why can't they remove it and let con Congress later on make some adjustments if the time will call for some adjustments? No? So that's what I'm asking Congress, the House, and the Senate to try to look at it seriously, because we really need this kind of um, situation than what we experienced before. Thank Your Honor, actually, just to add to uh, what Sir Gary mentioned, uh, when when the UP Law Center did a study on these uh, uh, on these constitutional restrictions, we could find none, in fact, in the G8 nor in ASEAN. We could not find any restrictions of that we uh, similar constitutional restrictions of the sort in the in the constitutions of these countries. It is really we're unique in that that way, you know. So uh, actually, uh, that. Uh, so I, I agree with Sir Gary. That's rather it's it's really somewhat archaic versus what our our uh, neighbors are doing. Uh, uh, on another point, uh, uh, to add to what Sir Gary mentioned about banking, there are a number of studies both in the School of Economics, uh, UP School of Economics, and I think PIDS, which point to the great amounts of consumer welfare that uh, that to redounded to 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 the gen to, to the general welfare when. Uh, when trans when air airlines and telecommunications were were opened up, and I think we can see, and, and we've experienced this in terms of lower cost fares and so on. So uh, I think that uh, that certainly more competition and perhaps adding even uh, uh, for through foreign direct investments can certainly help in that regard as well. The only reason why I. Um I think, no, in 1991, or when, well, ito Commonwealth Act pa nga to, eh, no, for the construction. I think this has been there for the last 80 years. Tap not construct, tama po ba? No, 80 years, wala pa tayo sa mundo nito. Um, and really, I think the, the spirit here is to protect um, the small construction companies uh, from intense competition coming from the uh, from the outside, but I don't know if that is applicable now. That's why I'm asking um, experts if this is still applicable now, and um, if it's not applicable, what have we lost no, over the past 80 years because of this very restrictive provision? No? Uh, oh no, I think there are a number of estimates as regards how much we're, for example, just just on traffic alone, how many billions we're losing a day. I think. To, to, to traffic and lost productivity. I think uh, we can, st even that alone, we can start there, and that's a significant amount. I think I would subscribe to what uh, Vince, Mr. Dizon said earlier, technology. You know? um, uh, I, I, no, I, I'm trying to remember when I was still a mayor, and uh, most of the contractors, when you invite them to bid and they participate, um, a lot of them will still use the very manual type of process, no? 
um, you know, meaning, you know, tao sa, uh, what's good, and daming tao, and that ang ginagamit nila yung, you know, very manual uh, equipment. And uh, a simple two kilometer road will probably take about a month or two months to finish. Um, I remember, I am sure you've seen this when you visit Japan. You know, when they fix a road, you know, it's overnight. No? Dahil kompleto yung gamit nila. Eh. They have, you know, they only have two or three people repairing a kilometer road. And they'd only take them um, probably four or five hours because of equipment and uh, technology. You know? And that's what I don't see here in the Philippines. Eh. Because um, those Japanese contractors cannot participate uh, in locally funded. You know, I, would, I would love to have those contractors Kung meron lang ganun, nung mayor ako, mas maganda because I can finish more more roads and more repairs. No? But uh, that was not available. I mean, uh, recalling, you know, again, anecdotes and recalling from my, my past experience. And I think that's what we missed out in the last uh, 80 years. No? Hopefully not in the next 80 years. Um, and I think we have a representative from the Philippine Retailers Association. Um, any comments, sir? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, my name is uh, Paul Santos, and I represent the Philippine Retailers Association. And uh, we would like to state that I would like to state that. Uh, in case of <coughs> attempts to liberalize the Foreign Investments Act, retail trade is one of those industries that uh, that this resolution seeks to to study. And in fact, there are bills in both houses of Congress that seek to uh, further liberalize the trade. Uh, we realize that uh, in the case of uh, the, for the Retail Trade uh, Liberalization Act, it actually represents uh, a balance between competing interests, between the competing interests of the state, of, uh, of consumers, and of businesses. Uh, when Congress enacted the Retail Trade Lib Act in 2000, uh, it recognized the fact that uh, foreign, uh, the industry needed, uh, needed to be liberalized. Uh, at the same time, it also needed to uh, it also needed to protect uh, the interest of retailers, especially MSME retailers, which constitute a bulk, which constitute the bulk of both, which constitute the bulk of uh, retail. And uh, in this case, in this case of uh, protection or protecting these MSMEs, I think Congress also recognized, Congress also recognized its responsibility uh, under the law to. Uh, protect uh, medium, small, uh, micro, small, and medium scale enterprises in uh, in the Magna Carta for MSMEs. No? And in this case, the Philippines is not alone in protecting uh, MSME retailers, and in fact, uh, is not alone in in in, in imposing uh, restrictions on the entry of foreign capital in retail trade. It's not this. It's not alone in ASEAN. Right. Um, in fact. Uh, in the case of in, in the case of the Philippines, uh, Philippines actually uh, uh, imposes probably uh, the least forms of restriction in terms of of uh, regulating the entry of foreign investment in retail trade. For example, uh, in the case of uh, as we all know, in the case of the Philippines, uh, for a foreign investor to own a hundred percent of a uh, retail enterprise, he must invest at least uh, $2.5 uh, million dollars or less. In the case of uh, luxury goods uh, retailers, they only need to invest uh, $250,000 per store. Now, in the rest of ASEAN, in the case of Thailand, for example, uh, uh, Thai law imposes a uh, uh, capital requirement of about 100 million baht. Uh, for 100% ownership of a, of a retail enterprise. That's about, uh, that, well, as, as, of the, as of exchange rates as of March, that's about uh, $3.2 million, or, or about uh, 20 million baht per store. Uh, in the case of Indonesia, 
their foreign investment negative list in the case of uh, retail stores is actually far more restrictive because not only does it impose uh, capital requirements, it also uh, limits investment activities of foreigners in specific uh, retail subsectors, meaning foreigners cannot participate in these specified uh, retail subsectors. That's also the case in, uh, in Malaysia as well. In the case of Malaysia, in, uh, uh, apart from capital requirements, again, there are certain retail subsectors that are off limits to, uh, to foreign investment. Um, and also, also in the case of Malaysia, for certain retail formats, not only are there capital uh, requirements and the business activity requirements, there are uh, racial requirements as well regarding the um, employment of uh, native or local Malaysians as part of the board of directors of that uh, retail enterprise. So in this case, Your Honor, we see that uh, at least in these countries, uh, retail trade is recognized as a driver of, of economic development and as a means for uh, MSMEs and entrepreneurs to improve their lives. And these countries have taken active steps to, uh, to protect these businesses from, from foreign competition. We, we believe that the balance um, struck by uh, RA uh, 8762 uh, is sufficient to promote the interests of, of, all, of all stakeholders, the state, consumers, uh, and uh, <coughs> MSMEs alike. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney. Uh, we'll probably have a, a deeper and more intense discussion when we finally discuss the uh, proposals on the retail trade liberalization. Um, I was telling Mr. Van Hattem that uh, we have a new chair in the Committee on Trade, Senator Pimentel, and um, I am of the view that uh, he will probably hear that uh, proposal soon. And we'll, in, we'll invite you to share your, your thoughts. Um, any last words from the body? Any last words? Uh, uh, if none, let me uh, just have um, some reminders. Uh, any position papers, please submit to us uh, on or before July 26. Uh, that's next Thursday. And for NEDA and P PIDS, we're um, giving you your assignment of uh, coming up with a uh, study research on um, the different industries um, being discussed or different industries under the FINL. No? Um, this is in preparation uh, maybe in the future uh, if we file uh, amendments to the specific laws that deal with uh, the different sectors. But uh, we should already uh, commence the research because that will take time. And Secretary Tevez mentioned earlier that will really take a lot of um, effort to uh, come up with that research. Uh, with PRC, um, also research on uh, the benefits of those uh, reci reciprocity uh, that were um, uh, implemented in the past. No? We want to learn that. And from SEC, um, also some proposals, uh, sir. Alam ko maraming, um, there are a lot of um, different interpretations in some of the terminologies. Please submit to us um, reposition papers to include uh, clarifications or clarificatory uh, proposals. Uh, PCC or um, policy note on construction and the others. Uh, with that, again, thank you very much for your time, and uh, thank you very much uh, for coming here uh, to the Senate, even though the weather is not so um, cooperative. But thank you. Thank you for your participation. Meeting is suspended. <laughs>